Roll call. Director Hansen. Here. Meek. Here. Myers. Here. Peterson. Here. Ray. Here. Williams. Here. Director Weinegar remotely. Present. Present. And before we move to the pledge, Director Weinegar, do you have anything for the audience that you would like to speak to? <laughs> yeah, so um, I got a surprise this morning and I um, gave birth to a little baby girl. And so I am remote from the hospital, um, but I am aware and present for this important meeting tonight. Um, but I, something else to be aware of is if a nurse comes in, I may just block my screen. So for that time being, but I will still be here and present. Well, excellent. And congratulations on the birth of your new baby girl. Congratulations. Thank you. And I, I think we will understand if you need to turn your camera off at any point this evening. So thank you. With that, we'll move to the Pledge of Allegiance. Moving into item number three. Item number three is convene in executive session, a closed session. The recommendation is that the Board of Education convenes in executive session, a closed session for purposes of holding conference with the district's attorneys to receive legal advice on specific legal questions pursuant to CRS 24-6-402-4B, including conferences to receive legal advice on specific legal questions related to pending litigation, including Douglas County School District RE1 at Al versus Douglas County Health Department, Douglas County Board of Health, pending in the United States District Court for the District of Colorado, Civil Action Number 21 CV 02818 JLK, and Marshall v. Douglas, uh, Douglas County Board of Education et al., pending in District Court, Douglas County, Case Number 22 CV 30071, and also receive legal advice on specific legal questions concerning the interpretation of superintendent contract provisions and the board's authority regarding the negotiation and approval of superintendent contract. Um, do we have a motion regarding executive session? So moved. Moved by Myers. Second. Second by Williams. Um, I move to amend the agenda to expand the reasons um, to include additional topics for legal advice conflict of interest concerns related to current and proposed board attorneys and implications of the previous agreement of retaining board attorney Will Trackman. Do we have a motion regarding the amendment to add additional items to the reason to go into executive session? I believe motion has been made and I'll second it. Excuse me, we have a motion by Meek. We have a second by Ray to add that to the motion. And if you could restate one time, uh, expand con uh, to include conflict of interest in the current litigation. Uh, so conflict of interest concerns related to the current and proposed board attorneys and implications of the previous agreement of retaining board attorney Will Trackman. Okay, thank you. Uh, with that, we will call the roll for the amended reason to enter executive session. Hanson. Aye. Meek. Aye. Myers. No. Peterson. Aye. Ray. Aye. Williams. Aye. Weiniger. No. Motion passes five to two. Uh, that is the two thirds required to enter executive session for all the reasons stated. At this point, we will adjourn and enter executive session and we will resume upon conclusion of executive session. Prior to adjourning though, uh, I must list all the re, uh, required personnel for executive session. That will be all board directors. Director Peterson, before you do that, yes. I think we still need to do a motion to enter an exec session that was okay, the that approval of 
correct. Amendment. Thank you, Director Ray. That was approval of amendment. So let me first read the people that would be uh, part of director, or excuse me, part of executive session. Requested members include all seven board directors, either in person or virtually. Council Mary Klamesh, Councils Elliot Hood and Jack Peters, both of Kaplan and Ernest, on the first issue, which is Douglas County School District versus uh, Department of Health. Um, same for all directors, and then Council Matt Hagerty regarding the Marshall v. Douglas, uh, Douglas County Board of Education case, and then all directors, including Melissa Barber of Kaplan and Ernest regarding negotiation of superintendent contract. Also requested in the first part would be acting superintendents Andy Abner and Danelle Hyatt. Back to the primary motion, which is to enter executive session, uh, and that will be via uh, motion by Myers and seconded by Williams. Director Hansen. Aye. Director Meek. Aye. Director Myers. Aye. Director Peterson is aye. Director Ray. Aye. Director Williams. Aye. Director Weiniger. Aye. That enter executive session is passed seven to zero. At this time, we will now adjourn and enter executive session and reconvene following executive session.
We will bring the Board of Education meeting back into session and continuing with item number four, the DCS Spotlight for Career and Technical Education. If we have post-secondary readiness coordinator, Amy Barker to present or Super Acting Superintendent Hyatt. I will get us started. If Amy Barker and the whole CTE crew could come up and join me, that would be fabulous. So good evening, everyone. Tonight, student and staff recogni recognitions will look a little different. I'm excited to turn the microphone over to our own post-secondary readiness coordinator, Amy Barker. She and members of her department will highlight some accomplishments of students who are taking advantage of career and technical education in the Douglas County School District. They will also discuss some of those CTE programs and opportunities that are available for all of our students. We are thrilled to have you here this evening to highlight our exceptional CTE programs. Amy. Thank you. So good evening. Um, as the post-secondary readiness team, um, we are honored to support pathway programming that brings meaningful opportunities to students in our district through career and technical education programs, concurrent enrollment courses, and work-based learning opportunities. Our students have experiences that not only prepare them for the future, but also prepare them to make informed decisions about the future and what is the right path for them. Uh, February is actually CTE month, and we normally like to celebrate and highlight at that time. However, it is a busy time for our students and instructors as they are preparing for competitions, they're off at leadership conferences, they're running service projects, fundraising, and even some advocate for um, support for programming at legislature. So we wanted to take a moment tonight and celebrate in summary the accomplishments of our students and acknowledge the hard work of our instructors who support these students and guide them to success. So each CTE program has a designated career and technical education student organization, or we call it a CTSO, that offers students the opportunity to advance their skills, apply them in real world situations, and gain leadership experience along the way. You might know names like DECA, TSA, uh, FFA, things like that. So many of our students participate in CTSOs, and here's a summary of some of our Douglas County students' accomplishments so far this year. To be honest, there's more celebrations than we had time for this evening, um, so we kind of compiled the list. I don't have individual names and necessarily schools that I'm going to be giving, but this is like an approximate of numbers. So DECA, which is our marketing organization, had 70 students qualified for nationals, we have seven state champions in different competition areas, and we have two state officers that are newly elected. Um, and if you don't know anything about a state officer, it's a very competitive process and a very admirable um, accomplishment. The TSA organization, which is STEM and engineering, they have 65 students qualified for nationals. We have 13 state champions in their competition areas in the district and two state officers, one being president, of the Colorado TSA organization. For HOSA, HOSA is our health science and biotech organization. We have 30, 34 students qualified for nationals. We have 12 state champions in their competition area. And we have, again, two state officers newly elected. ProStart is our culinary and catering organization. We have a state championship management team. They've also been recognized with different awards. Our Colorado Student Media Association, excuse me, um, that is connected to broadcast journalism and yearbook. They received all Colorado recognition, two awards of commendation, and they have qualified 22 students to national competition. We have Colorado Thespians. They have multiple programs across the district that have received superior ratings for their different competitions and have qualified students to nationals. And this year, a little bit smaller group, we have an aviation club that has its first round of students that have passed their private pilot ground course, are preparing for their FAA written test and in, in their um, progress towards their private pilot's license this year. So we really have some great accomplishments of our DCSD students, and we want to congratulate all of them and congratulate the teachers for their hard work and their preparation in supporting students. I'm now going to turn this over for more than CTSO results to our CTE specialist, Krista Tonkrin. Right. Thank you. Thank you guys for having us. Um, 
Just a couple more numbers for you guys. Um, Douglas County offers 24 different uh, pathways across six different industry sectors or career clusters that we call them. So we um, don't replace academic learning, but we just really complement or, or complement it or enhance it, I guess, if you will. So it's just kind of adding on to their high school experience. What we're finding through lots of different research is that high quality um, CTE programming links education and courses, aligns curriculum. Um, we're finding industry standards um, alignment and providing that hands-on on work-based learning experience really enable students to apply their skills in real-world scenarios. And that's really beneficial for these kids. Um, so tonight, um, I want to welcome one of um, our amazing um, Douglas County teachers and her student in a cutting-edge program at Rock Canyon High School, um, Ms. Susan Petrie and Daniel Grammer. So they're here tonight um, to tell us a little bit about the biotech program um, and what, what he's doing and, and, and all the really great things happening in our district. So thank you, guys. I'm going to be really quick and just say um, thank you. Uh, as the biotech teacher at Rock Canyon, I am so fortunate to work with such great students. There are now actually four courses in our pathway. Daniel, I've been um, able to teach three years of his four years at high school. So I'm going to pass it over to him and just let him talk because he's got a lot to share with you about what biotech has done for him. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Daniel, as you, as you heard. Um, I'm currently in the last year of the biotech program. It's called CTE Biotech Capstone. Um, and we act as mentors for current research students uh, going through the uh, investigative process of biotechnological projects. Uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about what I've been able to accomplish in biotech and how that's helped me prepare for college and discover my pathway. Um, in year two, which is experimental design, you design and conduct your own biotechnological research experiment. Uh, my group did C. elegans, which are microscopic nematode worms. We got genetically modified ones that were modified to produce Alzheimer's plaques in their neuromuscular junctions, which means that as the disease progressed, they would get paralyzed. And we exposed them to different common, uh, uh, common medication. Benadryl, it's a diphenhydramine. It's an anticholinergic, uh, which means it prevents one of the neurotransmitters in the neuromuscular junctions from operating. Uh, and we investigated how that would affect the progression of disease in, in the worms. And then this year, I'm doing a cell culture project. I'm working with RANM cells, which are insulinoma cells. They're tumorigenic cells taken from the uh, pancreas of a rat. And I'm culturing them with uh, a PARP inhibitor, which is a current anti-cancer drug called Olaparib, and then an experimental antibiotic to see if the combination of the two drugs can uh, help treat the cancer better than just the PARP inhibitor, uh, trying to address multi-drug resistance. Um, throughout the, the program, you gain soft and hard skills. Uh, in considering soft skills, teamwork is huge, at least in, in the year two program, because you have a team of four, especially in COVID, we had cohorts at our school, which meant that two of our team members were in A cohort and two of our team members were in B cohort. So we learned the skills to communicate online. We wrote an entire research proposal. We pitched without ever meeting the other two people in the cohort in person. We met in February. We'd been working since August. Um, you also learn a lot of perseverance, problem-solving skills. I like to say that research is failing until you find something that kind of works, and then you run with it. But we, if, as an example, we spent nine weeks working on our synchronization process uh, to get good results for our actual data analysis. Synchronization is a age synchronization. We were just trying to uh, get all the worms the same age. And then this year, um, I've gotten to explore a little bit more of the technical side. Last year, I got my base certification, biotechnician assistant credentialing exam, which was something that was really cool that they offered. And I've been able to act sort of as a lab tech in addition to being a mentor, um, scheduling repairs and calibrations on stuff like our CO2 incubator uh, during our cell culture projects, um, repairing uh, volumetric pipettes, and uh, other such equipment. We've been writing SOPs, the team, there's six of us as year threes uh, for the, all the pieces of equipment in the lab. There are a lot of pieces of equipment in the lab. <laughs> um, so that next year's students can add to those and we can get a comprehensive program. But uh, the biotech program really just sells you on, on STEM. As you can see, I have the lab coat here. That was a product of year two. But I didn't really know what I wanted to do when I came into sophomore year. And intro to biotech, which is first year, gave me a spark. And then research gave me that I wanted to do research. And that's really important because a lot of people 
start research and then they find out that they don't want to do research. Uh, and then this year has been really honing communication skills um, so I can go on to college and get into a lab super quickly. I have connections now through the, the work that I've been doing and it really has just set me on a, a perfect path, so. Sorry about that. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Matt Chambliss, the concurrent enrollment specialist for Douglas County School District, and we're very excited about the opportunities that our DCSD students have in concurrent enrollment. Last year, we had over 6,000 of our students earn more than 19,000 college credits, and this saved Douglas County School District families over $3 million. Uh, concurrent enrollment is an excellent opportunity for our students in our CTE programs to earn college and high school credit at the same time. We're able to offer 123 different CE courses in Douglas County. 39% uh, of those classes are also CTE, so we work together as a post-secondary readiness department. Some of our popular options are in business, math, engineering, technology, and English. Uh, so for CE, it's a collaborative process. It includes our students, our parents, our counselors do a lot of work uh, in concurrent enrollment. They're a vital uh, part of our CE process. Um, it also involves teachers, administrators, and specialists on the Douglas County side. And we work with our post-secondary readiness partners that um, they have specialists and administrators from ACC and our other partners as well. Um, the demand for CE continues to grow. And we're excited to see how this incredible opportunity will impact the lives of our students in the future. So now I'd like to turn it over to one of our excellent CE students, John Pullen, and he's going to share a little bit about his CE experience. John. Good evening, everybody. Um, as I was just introduced, my name is John Pullen, and I'm actually a junior at Ponderosa High School right now. Um, throughout my high school career, I have taken several concurrent enrollment classes, and I found my experience to be a very positive one. I've, since my beginning of my high school career, I've completed two English courses. I'm on my way to finishing two math courses, and I also attended a CE business course that was offered at Ponderosa. And honestly, it was a really awesome experience. It pushed me to be better. It pushed me to learn more. It pushed me to really start thinking about what I want to do after high school and really what's going to give me kind of that flame and that passion and motivation to find something that I like and to kind of stick with it. So it certainly has helped me prepare for my future. Um, in particular, it definitely helped me prepare for college um, and the courses I will take after I graduate from Ponderosa. Um, there's more in-depth content, and because of that, I've definitely developed better study skills. And honestly, I think more importantly, more confidence in myself and my capabilities as a student. And that, in turn, has definitely allowed me to feel more optimistic about my life after high school and my studies after high school. Additionally, I also found that the credit from these classes has made me eligible for various accelerated college courses. And these courses are really awesome opportunities, and they're things that will kind of help me um, get a jump start on my career after college. And and I would not be eligible for them had I not taken the opportunity and taken these concurrent enrollment classes. So overall, these concurrent enrollment courses that DCSD offers, they've had such a positive impact on my life, more than I really thought a class in high school could. Um, they've allowed me to grow as a student and definitely better prepare for my life after high school. So thanks. I just want to say one thing, John is probably being modest here, but he is also one of our newly elected state officers for our Colorado DECA. So. Good evening. Good evening. I'm Kathy Fromer, and I'm the Work-Based Learning Program Specialist for Douglas County School District, and I'm excited to be here tonight sharing with you the student successes within Work-Based Learning. So first, work-based learning is an extension of our CTE pathway programming. It is the final tier within the CTE program. Examples of work-based learning include career pathway internships, apprenticeships, part-time jobs, and extracurricular projects, just to name a few. Each provides students with real-world experiences that will help them to make informed decisions about their career future. 
This school year, our Douglas County School District students worked with Centura Health, Lockheed Martin, Hollis and Miller Architects, our various city, county, and district departments. Students interned and held part-time jobs within the career pathways of aviation, engineering, allied health, fire science, journalism, biotech, culinary arts, early childhood education, business management, real estate, marketing, cybersecurity, information technology, automotive services, welding, and other construction trades. The students' experiences have helped to shape their post-secondary goals. Here is a video of our students' reflection of their experience. My name is Cade Forbes, and I'm currently a freshman student at Colorado School of Mines. My senior year of high school at Castleview, I got to intern at ITC Compounding Pharmacy through this program. I truly believe that this program is one of a kind and a really, really great opportunity, even if you don't necessarily know what you want to do yet. There really aren't that many other places that allow high schoolers to go through an internship, and it's really special that Castleview has this program, and it's definitely something you should take advantage of. And I think that's it. Okay, great. We had one more, but it didn't make it. That's okay. But as you can see, work-based learning is transformational for our students. And, uh, you know, the network of business partners and mentors continues to grow within Castle Rock, Highlands Ranch, Parker, South Metro Denver, resulting in more opportunities for our students. Now that's something to celebrate. Now here is Amy for some final remarks. So I just want to finish up with saying thank you both, or thank everyone so much for letting us have this opportunity to celebrate our students and also recognize the teachers that put in the work and the time and effort to support their students. So we have some great things happening and we are very proud as a post-secondary readiness department to be sporting, supporting the programming um, and the opportunities that it offers to our students to succeed at the next level. So thank you. Thank you, Ms. Barker. Thank you, John and Daniel. Okay, moving on, we have item number five, acceptance of the agenda. The recommendation is that the Board of Education approves the agenda as presented. Um, and I think we have a possible amendment for the end of the evening. So do I have a motion to approve the agenda with a amendment to add executive session and to observe, adjourn, excuse me, adjourn from executive session as the last item prior to adjournment? So moved. Okay, moved by Ray. Second. Second by Myers, and I will call the roll. Hansen. I actually have a quick question. Oh, sure. Um, I haven't spoken with Director Winnegar, but um, I'm assuming that she's participating in this meeting six hours after having a baby to vote on the superintendent contract. And I'm just wondering if there's some way that we could move that earlier in the evening so that, I, I don't know how she's sitting there, but I just would love to help her if there's any way that we can. She's sitting there. <laughs> Dir Director Weiniger, do you have a comment on that? And uh, we'll certainly take your advice. I appreciate that. but. I feel like I'm the lucky one because I'm in a comfy bed <laughs> while you guys are in those stiff chairs. <laughs> but I appreciate that, Elizabeth. Um, I think it's important, though, that we hear public comment before we vote on superintendent. So I'm good with keeping the agenda as is. Okay. Uh, so the motion would be to approve the agenda as presented with the addition of executive session and to adjourn from that executive session prior to uh, the scheduled adjournment. Uh, Director Hansen. I believe um, Council Clemish has a comment. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Council, Council I think Clemish, that I with see. respect to notice of going into executive session, could the purpose for going into executive session be part of the motion? 
consistent with the statutory uh, requirements? Absolutely. And the reason uh, to add the item to go into executive session and adjourn from executive session would be to receive legal counsel on specific legal questions pursuant to CRS 246402-4B concerning interpretation of superintendent contract provisions and the board's authority regarding the negotiation and approval of a superintendent contract. In addition, uh, and we would ask for uh, the seven members of the board to be present, and also Melissa Barber from the uh, law firm of Kaplan and Ernest to be present in that meeting, and those would be the only folks that would need to attend. Thank you. I accept the modification to the wording of the agenda. Okay, excellent. So now we will call the roll. Uh, Director Hansen. Aye. Meek. Aye. Myers. Aye. Peterson. Aye. Ray. Aye. Williams. Aye. Weiniger. Aye. Passed by a motion of seven to zero as amended. Moving into item number six, the Mill Bond Ad Hoc Committee update. Is Mr. Ms. Brownrig available? Okay. Um, number one, I echo Director Hansen's feelings that we should keep this as short and sweet as possible. So I may shorten my presentation a little bit because I've, I've just never seen that kind of endurance. My name is Sandra Brownrig, and I am the chair of the Mill Bond Exploratory Ad Hoc Committee. And this is Krista Gilstrap. She's one of the communication co-chairs. And so we're here tonight to give you a very mundane update to our recent activities. Um, and because I like to editorialize, I do want to say, you going to give me one of these? Oh, that's good. And you can use that. Oh, good. Um, I think that it's a good thing that we are juxtaposed in the middle of the story that should be on the news, which would be the achievements of the students that we just heard and the teachers who inspire them versus what I suspect will turn out to be on the news. But I love what I heard. Those guys, that's amazing. It's what we should celebrate. All right, so with that in mind, in the past two years, we have survived a pandemic. Most of us have lost loved ones. We emerged from that to a war in Ukraine, we watched inflation spiral and we now live in a world where everything from buying furniture to building a house takes a lot more time and patience than it used to. Many of us are worried about our children's future in this suddenly met le much less certain world, instability is everywhere. As Jim Morrison of The Doors sang in Roadhouse Blues, the future's uncertain and the end is always near. And I think it's important for us to look at what we're doing in terms of assessing the feasibility, in terms of the macro environment, which is very unstable, which makes people emotional, which creates some of the chaos we find today. So, so does my inability to make technology work. How does that work? That way? There we go. All right. Do you think, the question that you have given us is, do we think that an MLO and bond could be successful in November? Really? All right. So, and that's not right. There we go. One example of the need for rapid response is our committee. We, the board formed, you guys formed us in February and gave us two months to come back and tell you whether funding in November would be feasible. That was not enough time, but point is if we, once we give you the feasibility report, you have until July 19th to put the ballot question on, I mean, to, to form the language, and then that independent committee needs to stand up and do the grassroots outreach, right? So every one of those time frames is quite short and aggressive. Uh, but tonight we're proposing that you let us extend our reporting into June. That doesn't stop that community outreach. It doesn't stop the fact that leadership can already get out there and talk about the compensation package that you approved last, you know, March 8th. 
and talk about the urgent need for funding because of the needs that already exist. So we can start a leadership outreach with the board, with the district leadership, and with the building leadership that runs concurrently with us assessing the feasibility. And we'll actually inform that. So what we have spent the, our time doing is gathering information from cabinet and from the other committees. One of the advantages that we've had this time versus last time when I did this is that the committees are actually very interlaced. Everybody was extremely responsive right away. And so they're all in communication. LRPC is definitely providing us with info on the capital needs. FOC has the deep dive on finance. We're just gathering that, facilitating some of the analysis and layering feasibility on top of that. So in April, we're going to do some community outreach, and I'll talk about qualitative analysis in just a little bit, because you want to, the, the part that is not reflected necessarily in the district's uh, presentations is what the feedback is from the community, what resonates, what doesn't resonate, the qualitative analysis. So we'll spend April doing that and doing some initial analysis of the presentations that we received last month. And then we'll extend and deepen that in May, perhaps take uh, the community outreach, which Krista will talk about in just a little bit, to people that are not affected by the school calendar. So maybe older people, et cetera. And there I go again, I can't do this. <laughs> um, so we have five sections for the MBEC. We have communications, needs and capacity analysis, financial analysis, feasibility analysis, and then our reporting group. How is everything going? Well, let's start with communications, and I'll give this to Krista. Oh, and you won't need that. Oh, you do that. <laughs> Hi, good evening. So um, I'm the co-chair for the communications along with Julie Gooden, and we are working on, we're working on getting a Sterling Ranch community. This is actually um, no longer updated. As of this morning, we've decided to push that Sterling Ranch forum date. Um, we did send you all an email, but you were in executive session, so you probably haven't seen it yet. Um, so we're just wanting to push that out a week or two just to make sure we do it well and um, have a good facility. It was just, we, we, it, we were running out of time. Um, we want um, whoever the new superintendent is going to be to be there. We would love for all of you to be there. So we are hoping for it to be a pretty big forum. Um, that we can get a good baseline data for bond initiatives that we might need. We are also working to get a survey out to our SAC and PTOs. Um, our thoughts behind that is our SAC and PTOs are our most informed and involved parents, and so we would love to get um, data from them, where they are, what knowledge do they have, what gaps might do have, what challenges might they see, because if they see it, the broader community will see it, so it'll give us a baseline um, with what we need to prepare to take to the broader community. So after that, our plan is to do more forums um, um, in some of the other, um, the canyons, Crystal Valley, and then also do broader community surveys, um, reach out to four key demographics that we think outside of our school community, um, double income, no kids families, retirees and empty nesters, business leaders, as well as um, families with young kids who are not quite in school yet and they don't think this affects them, which obviously they're wrong. So we wanna let them know that they wanna start paying attention now. Um, so that's a brief overview on what we're planning to do in communications. So back to Sandra. And I'd like to add that we will extend that effort uh, with the help of the Community Accountability Committee and Gary Colley, who is also present tonight. And thank you, Krista, and thank you, Julie Gooden, if you're listening in for all the work you've been doing. So next, when it comes to needs and financial analysis, we've seen several prop, uh, presentations from operations. And as I mentioned earlier, finance has provided three potential levels for an MLO. And uh, I have up there, again, change being constant, that we would have recommendations on the bond from finance March 24th. Our meeting on the 24th was canceled because we didn't have a quorum. And that is simply because we put a lot of really busy people on this particular committee and they're really good at what they do, but they have other obligations. So we're going to regroup next Wednesday and uh, modify the agenda from there. So, what we're also doing is the feasibility analysis I alluded to, and that'll be a long and, and complex document that we will provide to you in June. 
um, the initial stages for that, we are doing some analysis on the previous election data. And then um, Tanya Stewart, Bianca Smith, and John Freeman are working on a weighting model for some of for the, our huge list of potential factors that we've identified. And those have all dropped out of the presentations that staff have given us over the last month. Um, we've also explored projections for growth and uh, capacity in the district. The 2018 polling will be a very useful baseline to compare with this year's surveys. And much of the data may stay similar. Back then, we were concerned with teacher salaries and retention. Um, there was some concerns about leadership stability. It was actually one of the high points. Um, we wanted our district to be competitive. And as exhibited again tonight, we were proud of our students' achievement. Last time, though, um, the thing to note is that people verbalized more support for an MLO than they actually voted. So you had a 60% support level when they were polled, but when they voted, it was at something like 52, 54. Um, the thing that correlates with that, it's not causative, but correlates is trust. Because there's another question on there that has that same margin, that is, do you trust the district, and I'm paraphrasing, to be thoughtful stewards of taxpayer dollars? So we grow the trust, we pass the funding. Um, and then I'm not going to talk that much about the noise framework. I'll talk about it briefly. But reporting, like I said, we'll do this in June. And it'll be the findings for the capital needs, the, the possible financing levels, and the feasibility of each, and then a framework for future funding efforts. Our goal is to provide you the structure whereas you or future boards will be able to stand up another ad hoc committee quickly and not have to reinvent the wheel. All right. So... When you talk about qualitative data, so we're talking about the communications uh, activities, we wanted to have a framework that was solutions oriented. And this is called the noise strategic framework. If you've ever done strategic planning, you have SWATs, SWATs, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. That's rather brute force because it focuses you on the threats and the weaknesses. People just kind of, the way your mind works, you think about problems. You don't necessarily leverage strengths. And so it looks like that, and I find that incomplete and unhelpful. What you can do instead is a noise. So what you do with a noise is you set that strategic objective, let's say funding, and then you say, what do we need to do to make that happen? And the thing about this that you can also do is you can segment it. So you can have these questions, what can you as a community do to make that happen? What is a board? What is a district? You know, If everybody's on the same model, that'd be great. But in the community, what can we do to help the board achieve that goal. What opportunities exist? Opportunities could be things that are undiscovered in the, in the community already. Um, I mean, I'm sorry, in the district already. And then improvements are what we default to. What are the things that we can change? However, in the noise model, instead of saying, here's a whole list of things that need to change and I have no oversight into that. These are what are the relatively short-term things that could be changed that I might be able to play a part in so there's a little bit of accountability. And then strengths. What are the things that already exist in the district that are strengths that are ongoing? Um, I would say relatively little turnover at the cabinet level, for example. I would say that you guys have shown unity in standing up the MBEC and also in passing the compensation plan. And that last one is what's called an exception. An exception is not except for. An exception is what's exceptional and should be leveraged and should be replicated and increased. That unity that you guys have shown, that leadership, that would be an exception. So what you do with the analysis is you put all the factors out. You do a cluster analysis, so you find themes that emerge, and then you prioritize those. And we will be doing these in these small group forums throughout the district. We're not going to do them with this kind of slide, though. So when you tease out the improvements, the things that we've teased out of from these presentations in the last several uh, last month are that leadership unity I just talked about, building community trust, so the engagement with the community, like y'all will hopefully be able to attend our forum, and then reaching out to the leadership of community advocacy groups. Everybody has those affinity groups, could talk to those guys who are advocating for education 
communicate the urgency of the funding, the need, the timing, and do outreach. And then metric-wise, let's accelerate the polling so we measure the baseline now, and then we come back and find out what happens after you guys move the needle through that outreach. And then in terms of data clarity, that builds community trust because, for example, if we can provide apples to apples compensation comparisons where you have salary and benefits to our neighboring districts, that helps people trust that they're seeing the data they need to see. And then this one just happens to be a particular nit for me. Check that no tax increase language because, in my opinion, you're going to have an emphasis on older voters when you do go out for funding simply because it's 60 to 70 percent of the district. They may be, they're all the four demographics that Krista talked about. People who are my age don't buy no tax increase tax increases. There is no such thing for us as a no tax increase bond. You may be stepping down the debt, but just because I paid my mortgage off does not mean that I'm going to keep sending money to the mortgage company just because I'm used to my cash flow being at a certain number. So that's the kind of language you want to check. All right. Uh, so, next steps, we will not have the March 24th meeting, but we will next Wednesday. Work on that quantitative analysis, reschedule that Sterling Ranch Forum. I'll meet with Cabinet on the 31st to talk about polling and other activities. And then we'll report back to you if you're okay with that on the 26th. So, the question again is, what happens? Do we think that this would be successful in November? The other question that we do need to answer is what happens if it's not? And that's not a, I'm not fear mongering. I'm saying that in order for us to provide you with full information, that second piece also has to be addressed. And so as we segue into public comment tonight, I think that, like I said last time, we should look at things through the lens of funding. And so if you think funding is necessary, if we are going to fund the compensation plan and not have $151 million debt in four years, then the timing comes into play. And so hopefully we can temper our feedback and pull together to make whatever needs to happen happen in a realistic and pragmatic way. So that's it. Any questions? Director's questions? Director Meek? First, thanks so much for all your work. This is really great, and I appreciate all of the time that our community members are putting into this. Um, one question, one comment. So you mentioned polling, and I'm curious, are we using a professional pollster? Um, are we getting SAC feedback and other feedback that might influence the questions that we'll then ask? So I... As a committee, as a board advisory committee, we cannot direct district resources. However, we can partner with the district who is planning on doing polling and, and help structure that conversation. And so there will be a consultant there. Um, and so there will be a professional polling effort from the district. We don't have oversight on that, but we are able to contribute feedback. Um, for the SACs and the PTOs, we are going to do that. Uh, we, will, we will initiate that. It is my hope that we'll be able to ask district staff to look at the, the poll that we have in mind. Um, this was not the week to make that request, so I haven't raised the question yet, but I I'm hoping to, So, because we're hoping to have that out in the next week or two. That is a very basic survey. It is not as, as it won't be as sophisticated as anything from the district. I have a follow-up then. Um, mm -hmm. Perfect. Thank you. And I really appreciate the noise framework that mm -hmm. you were showing. I think it's very positive and aspirational. Um, my only comment would be on slide 15. You mentioned bipartisan engagement. And I just worry about using bipartisan. Um, Is that this one? No. Yeah. Page. No. No. Slide 15. That one? No. Next one. Yeah. Under build community trust. Um, bipartisan, I think, refers to two parties, and I mean, honestly, we shouldn't be in thinking about politics. I think maybe more what you were getting at is valuing diverse perspectives across the district. That's so that's exactly just, right. Yeah, that's just a term I might be cautious with. I would call that poor language at two o'clock in the morning when I was doing the presentation. Um, and yeah, holistic engagement. Um, 
diverse. However you want to put that, that's exactly what I meant. Thank you for that. Other Anybody directors? Else? And Director Weiniger, if you want to chime in there, just raise your hand on the screen and uh, Mr. Blair will monitor that as well. Okay, without any other questions, thank you, Ms. Brownberg, thank and you. thank you, Ms. Gilstrap. Thank you, Krista. Okay, moving on to item number seven, public comment. Purpose of public comment is to balance the ability to hear diverse viewpoints from a broad spectrum of citizens throughout the district while allowing the Board of Education to conduct business in an orderly and efficient manner. When speaking, please remain respectful and address the board rather than the guests and staff in the room. This is your time to speak. And I'd like to emphasize that we've actually had some issues in the past couple of meetings where we've had uh, speakers at the podium addressing people in the audience. Please keep your uh, comments directed to the board. To respect a speaker's free speech, please do not interrupt them while they are at the podium providing comments. You will have a 15 second notice prior to any of your time so you can wrap up your comments. When your time is done, please leave the podium. If the audience wants to react between speakers, feel free to do so by while being respectful and honoring the next per, uh, person's time to speak. Attendees who create a disturbance or disrupt speakers while they're speaking will be asked to leave the room after a prior warning, and the board president will be responsible for determining when audience members are being disruptive. With that, we have over 100 speakers tonight. We will move uh, through this, uh, but we will take some breaks during the time. First person up, we always start with students, will be Owen Wicks, followed by Amity Wicks, and then Chris Wicks. Owen Wicks, you're up. Good evening. As many of you know, I recently started a Turning Point chapter and to provide a voice for the ideals of which I value, but more importantly, to having conversations regardless of political standing in a respectful way. Since this chapter has started, I've received quite the array of insults online and at school. While it surprises me that most of my treatment, what surprises me most about my treatment is that it's from adults, not primarily my peers, which I find to be unacceptable. I don't agree with a lot of the things the other people say, but I will never attack the character of someone with whom I disagree. If you, if you believe what, what you're doing is right, it should be able to stand on its own. It shouldn't need you to attack those with, who disagree with it. I'm here today to encourage those who disagree with me to talk to me as my beliefs are not fragile, nor is my resolve. If I can stand here and defend my beliefs without attacking others as a teenager, all you adults out there can do are more than capable of doing it as well. And I implore you to do so. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wicks. Uh, we have Amity Wicks, Chris Wicks, followed by Iko Browning. Hello, I just have a few quick comments. Um, I would, since you mentioned addressing the board, I would like to uh, request that the board urge those who still think it is okay to slander minors and say all kinds of awful things about them and urge others to call their schools to say the same thing and shut down their school um, after school clubs, um, that uh, maybe you could suggest that they find a new hobby. Um, bullying and slander of a minor is really for those with low character, and slandering a person after you've blocked them from a group is extremely classless, petty, and small. It's clearly not working anyway because we are still here. You've attacked the wrong family. We will not crumble due to your cruelty. We are not going anywhere. My next three points have to do with our business at hand, the superintendent selection. Neither candidate has had classroom experience. However, one has run this very district for two years and did it very well. Others have or cite the statistic to support this. Mr. Windsor also left off of his resume that he was a representative of the Cherry Creek Teachers Union in the application process. This calls into question his willingness to be transparent about him, how he might interact with that special interest group. While Mr. Windsor is clearly an impressive overall, has clearly an impressive overall seconds. resume and might make great future superintendent, Aaron Kane has the job experience and will not only running the district, but also spearheading a successful passing of an MLO bond, which we desperately need. I urge you to select Aaron Kane as our next superintendent. Thank you, Ms. Wicks. Chris Wicks, Iko Browning, followed by Jason Hurd. Chris Wicks. Good evening. The thing that keeps coming to mind and I brought it up last time is why do we all come here to speak? It's because we care about our kids, their education, the teachers, and the system. 
Um, all of us want what's best for those we care about. As we discussed last time, some adults have continued their written and verbal attacks of my family and my son. They're making claims that are untrue, and they're doing it the very thing they're accusing us of around hate and judgment. I, I just ask that we raise the bar and get out of the gutter of slanderous speech to share our differences of opinion in a respectful way. I stand firm in my belief that all of our opinions are needed in order to move forward and that differing opinions are a very good thing. I ask that others would give the same consideration to us that we do to them. I respect those with differing perspectives and views. In fact, they challenge me to think differently. We all need to learn to listen, and particularly when the perspectives are different than our own. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wicks. Iko Browning, Jason Hurd, Robin Webb. Iko Browning. Hello, President Peterson, directors, acting Superintendent Hyatt, and acting Superintendent Abner. Do you want neighborhood schools to be just the place where kids with special needs and kids without transportation go to get their education? That is the end destination if your philosophy of choice is taken to its most extreme ends. I quote a director in an email response I received. I support school choice, neighborhood schools, charter schools, private schools, and home schools. It is the choice of the parent to choose for their child to choose their education. I have been in the public school system for over 25 years, so I do support neighborhood schools. I hope you understand that if the MLO bond does not pass, neighborhood schools will not be built, and the sustainability to pay teachers on the newly passed compensation plan will not be viable. Maybe let's work together to stop the negative rumors, sincerely. Directors, you recognize that getting a bond MLO passed is an uphill struggle and unlikely in this climate. We need the community to unite and support funding for infrastructure and to sustain the predictable staff pay scale. This includes people who don't like to pay taxes, people who don't have kids in the school district, people who don't trust you to be good stewards of the seconds. school district, people who see your pre-decided support of superintendent candidate Aaron Kane as a sign that you prioritize charter public schools over neighborhood public schools. People who see your choice of a superintendent candidate who's not an educator as a lack of respect for the thousands of licensed educators in DCSD. Thank you, Ms. Brown. Jason Hurd, Robin Webb, Matthew Smith. Mr. Hurd. Um, I would like to discuss the notion of division raised by many in the community, the teachers unions, and many opposed to Aaron Kane. Uh, very often what we see here is division created by a given party and then falsely attributed to another party. The game is often a way to create an appearance of chaos in order to manipulate public opinion. In the case of our current school board controversies, the teachers unions and other repeat actors are fomenting carefully orchestrated and manufactured outrage and then blaming that outrage on those from whom they seek to remove from power. Our kids, our kids First Board was elected democratically by a majority of Douglas County voters. These dark actors are performing nothing short of circumventing democracy and the will of voters with deliberate and pur purposeful actions designed to overturn a fair and legitimate election. To all parents of Douglas County, don't be fooled by this. You're being manipulated. Your democratic rights are attempting to be stripped. I know history and these tactics are nothing new. Reject these acts of sabotage and support our new board and Aaron Kane. From this, we will pass the majority supported MLO so that we can finally pay our teachers what they deserve, which we all agree on. Begin to dismantle the one-sided political activism that is ever present in our classrooms so that Douglas County's academics seconds. can once again be the envy of the entire state. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hurd. Robin Webb, Matthew Smith, Catherine Lees. Robin Webb. Hello, I'm Robin Webb. First of all, thank you for switching out the superintendent. I was one of the parents who begged our new health board to pass the PHO because of the seriously negative effects the masks were having on my child. I reached out to Corey Wise and the board members repeatedly and told them that she was suicidal and none of them ever even bothered asking me if she was okay. People like that do not care about your kids. 
I took Corey in the previous, previous board's lawsuit because of the PHO personally. Due to that and many other things, I was happy to see him go. I would like to express my support for Erin Kane as a leader for our future. I do not have time to cover her many positive attributes, but I'd like to touch on two. She turned around a negative culture, resulting in a reduction in turnover of teachers from 20% to 13%, school leaders 23% to 8%, and staff 25% to 18%. We love our amazing teachers, leaders, and staff, and we'd really like to keep them. Somebody who can bring us together is obviously needed. The second point is she wants parents to have a place at the table. Enough said. Thank you very much for trying to work together. I can tell that you are. We appreciate it. And Kaylee, you're a rock star. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Webb. Matthew Smith, Catherine Lees, Kelly Mayer. Mr. Smith. Good evening. Um, if you have more presentations like the CTE, you may be able to get me on board with an MLO. Just want to throw that out there. Um, I want to take a quick moment to apologize to Director Ray. In a previous meeting, I mistakenly stated that you were a licensed counselor. It turns out I was wrong. I was co very confused by your bio, your email signature, and your references to it at previous meetings. Um, I see that you've recently removed that from your bio and email signature, but I really wanted to take a moment and apologize. Um, I would like to express the need to vigorously defend yourself with ongoing litigation and appeals. Um, as is any Confederate flag waving, Bob Dick or Harry, uh, wait, did I get that wrong? I mean, Tom, Tom Dick or Harry, with no kids in the district, can set up an activist crowd, crowdfunding campaign and file lawsuits that were teed up by your three colleagues up there. Um, I would like to highlight some prime examples of strict adherence to sunshine laws from the three current members in the previous board. I'm sure we all remember um, Dr. Tucker, his employment status, and all the public meetings surrounding that. Uh, furthermore, there was a decision to team up uh, with certain parents in the district and sue our county health department. And again, all the public meetings and comments around that. Thank you. Have a great night. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Catherine Lees, Kelly Mayer, followed by Catherine Beck. Catherine Lees. Good evening, President Peterson and directors. The class of 2022 deserved better. The 5,000 seniors that are graduating this year never experienced the good DCSD. Their formative elementary years were at the height of the reformer years. The same reformers that every single one of you, every single one of you said were detrimental to our district, to our staff, and especially our students. I ask each of you to be curious about how the reformers really impacted these seniors for the last 12 years. Remember, a student's learning environment is the educator's teaching environment. We have data from those years that show teaching and learning environment at many schools and DSD, DCSD as a whole was not good. When staff is supported and respected, all of their energy can go to instruction, care, and needs of the students. I know what it feels like when the learning environment is compromised, and it feels like that all over again. I am begging you all to do better. Your actions, your decisions, your behavior will have long-lasting impacts on this district. Step up and do the job of a school board director. Serve the 64,000 students creating a supportive learning environment where each student can reach their potential. The class of 2034 deserves better. 15 seconds. Thank you, Ms. Lees. <laughs> Kelly Mar Mayer, Catherine Beck, and Carolyn Williamson. Uh, good evening, directors. I want to start by congratulating uh, Director Winnegar on her new baby. Um, my name is Kelly Mayer. I'm the mom of nine former and current DCSD students. Uh, <laughs> I am here, I get that a lot. Um, I'm here to say that my kids and all 64,000 DCSD students deserve better. The newest members of the school board ran on a platform of kids first. I have not seen any evidence that you have put kids first since you were sworn in. Our students and staff need stability. They need to be able to concentrate on teaching and learning. The amount of chaos that the district has been thrown into is unbelievable. Firing Corey Wise and losing Sid Rundell has hurt students and staff and devastated our community. We need you to do better. You are in the majority. You can push through whatever agenda you want. We're just asking for transparency and following all laws and procedures. 
this isn't really much to ask for. DCSD staff, students, and community deserve better. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Mayor. Catherine Beck, Carolyn Williamson, Sarah Wu. Ms. Beck. First of all, congratulations to uh, Director Weininger. Uh, I'm the parent of a sophomore, and I spent 11 of my 25 years in education teaching in Douglas County. I'm also a doctoral student with a focus on educational leadership and organizational performance. I want to thank Directors Ray, Meek, and Hansen. I'm appreciative of your integrity, your leadership, and your unwavering dedication to the students and staff of our district. And the remainder of my comments are directed to Mr. Peterson and the other board majority members. I watched the March 11th meeting in complete disbelief. In addition to being a monumental waste of time, it was a clear demonstration of power grabbing, underhanded tactics, and blaming others for your mistakes, a practice I uh, concern that you will continue to do tonight. I feel the way you res you've responded to the lawsuit against you has lacked accountability and integrity. With great power comes great responsibility. You wanted that power and congratulations, now you have it. You also have an obligation to be responsible stewards of our school district. But with every unethical action, you are chipping away at the very foundation of Douglas County School District. When teachers and staff leave for other districts, when parents take their students to other districts, and when our students' academic growth and social emotional health suffer, all of that will be on you. Not Directors Ray, Meek, and Hanson. 15 seconds. They've spent the past four months trying to save you from yourselves and your ignorance. When or if you finally decide to start taking responsibility for what you're doing to erode the district, I'm afraid it will be too late. What a tragedy for our community, our staff, and especially our kids. They deserve better. Thank you, Ms. Beck. Carolyn Williamson, Sarah Wu, followed by Laura Allen. Good evening. I would like to comment on the collusion that was going on with Aaron Kane, even to the point where right after you guys were elected. Um, this picture, which was posted on your Kids First um, page, shows that you had a retreat in Estes Park. Um, and we have a lot of questions. Um, Aaron Kane, by her own admission, was also there. And Trackman reportedly also attended. So some of the questions we have is, what is in your binders? Who produced the binder content? What BOE business was discussed in this clandestine retreat? Why were American Academy Charter School Executive Director Aaron Kane and reportedly DCSD BOE Attorney Will Trackman at this retreat? Given this clandestine retreat that the other board members were not invited to, how is Aaron Kane an acceptable candidate for district superintendent after this blatant collusion with Kids First board members away from public scrutiny behind closed doors? How do you ever expect to build the kind of trust that you need to pass a mill levy override? 15 seconds. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Williamson, Sarah Wu, Laura Allen, followed by Amy Winju. Sarah Wu. Thank you for your time. I am here to echo the judge's injunction asking the board to respect the law and conduct public business in the public eye. Put your egos aside and put kids first. If you cannot do this, then our community cannot possibly trust you with additional MLO and bond funds. In November of last year, you four directors met in Estes Park to determine the new direction of the school district. This new direction has never been presented to the public. The meeting didn't violate any laws, but it clearly set up a pattern of behavior for you as board members. 
Once the new board members were sworn in, one of you signed a contract to take Will Trackman on as legal counsel on behalf of the entire board. This contract was signed on December 1st before any public discussion or vote authorizing this one board member to do this on December 7th. Afterward, this board member appeared in the Board of Health video making statements on behalf of the entire board. These statements were not reviewed or approved by the rest of the board and the entire appearance was unapproved. Next, this board member escalated this behavior to use one-on-one -on -one phone calls with three other board members to decide to fire Corey Wise outside of the public view. At this point, a local resident sued for violation of Colorado's open meeting laws. A judge has since reviewed the case and granted a preliminary injunction to document that the board is in fact required to conduct all public business in public with proper notifications and required process. After the preliminary injunction was granted, seconds. this board member called an emergency meeting to try to sneak through a resolution that hadn't had proper notice. If it had passed, the board would have been in contempt and we would have had to pay for even more court fees and legal fees. Please put kids first and stop putting your ego in front of it. Thank you, Ms. Wu, Laura Allen, Amy Winchu, followed by Tricia Ackerman. Ms. Allen. Hi, thank you so much for letting me speak tonight. Um, early on in my teaching career, I had this amazing principal that I worked for, and she used to always say to us that if we were at a crossroads trying to make a decision that affected kids, we should always ask ourselves, the choice that I'm about to make, is that what is in the best interest of kids? And if we could always say yes to that question, then we knew we were kind of on the right track. Um, I know that I agree with some of you and I know I don't agree with all of you and that's okay. But I'm going to ask all of you to respectfully think about that question tonight when you're making the decisions you're making. Um, when I think about how much a lawyer is paid and I'm, they're wonderful, obviously, they do great work. But I think about how much that costs the district to to continue to pay many lawyers to fight something that maybe you think that you're right, maybe you think the courts made a mistake, but if you're asking yourself, is fighting and appealing this really what's in the best interest of kids? Is that really how we can best support them academically? I think that will help guide your answer. And I, I ask you to just think about that tonight. 15 um, seconds. If you could hand any principal in this district three to $400 for every hour that an appeal would take to go directly to kids, I think it would be amazing the growth, the extra growth that we could see in kids in just a short period of time. So please consider that. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Allen. Amy Winchu, Trisha, uh, Trisha Ackerman, followed by Krista Mann. Hi, good evening. Um, tonight I'm going to discuss um, meetings that the um, minority board had with WISE. So let's hear about board members having three on ones with super, previous um, superintendent WISE. On the 29th of January in 2021, Director Meek, Director Ray, former Director Holtzman, and Kaylee Leba of the American Federation of Teachers had a meeting with former super WISE. Um, on the 23rd of February in 2021, Commissioner Layden, Director Ray, and Director Meek had a meeting with uh, former Super Wise. For two on ones, Director Hansen and former Director Holtzman met with former Super Wise on at least seven times in the 2021 school year. Director Meek and former Director Leong had met at least four times. Director Ray and former Director Holtzman met at least two times. Director Ray met with former Super Wise at least five times on one-on-ones. And here are other things on former Super Wise's calendar. Did y'all know that on March 22nd, 2021, former Super Wise had a meeting scheduled titled Gender neutral bathroom discussions. I wonder if that came up in all your all three on one, two on one, or one on one meetings. Thank you, Ms. Winju. <laughs> Trisha Ackerman, Krista Mann, followed by Erica Devlin. Ms. Ackerman. Good evening. 
my name is Trisha Ackerman. I was a Douglas County school teacher for 13 years, and I raised three children in the Douglas County schools. I'm here in support of our new, of our new board members and also for Erin Kane as best candidate for superintendent. I'm really impressed with her background and her effects efforts, especially already serving as an interim superintendent. After looking at the resumes and listening to both interviews, I feel confident that Erin Kane would be the best choice for our Douglas County School Board. I think her experience behind the bond levy will help by increasing the pay of our teachers and helping retention. She is most prepared to help pass the bond for our Douglas County Schools. Another reason I believe Erin Kane is the best candidate is while supervising her American Academy, she was able during the pandemic to, pandemic to keep her schools open even though she had division between the staff and the parents. I believe Erin Kane will be able to bring our community back together with her experience in handling these past situations. I believe Erin Kane is a great record for lowering teacher turnover at her schools of 8% versus the Douglas County of 14% during the same time period. 15 seconds. Thank you for considering these comments for my support of Erin Kane. Thank you, Ms. Ackerman, Krista Mann, Erica Devlin, Luke Johnson. Ms. Mann. Good evening, and thank you for the opportunity to address the board tonight. Um, as a parent with a child in Douglas County Schools, I've listened to the public interviews of the two superintendent finalists. And one candidate definitely stood out as a visionary, um, someone who is prepared to lead this district now and into the future. One candidate is um, and prepared to lead us back into academic excellence and has a proven track record in this area. One candidate supports raising compensation for teachers and staff despite the unknowns with the upcoming MLO and is committed to and has, has a proven track record of reallocating funds where they need to be in the classrooms and in the paychecks of teachers and staff. This candidate is Erin Kane and I fully support her as the sole finalist for superintendent. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Mann, Erica Devlin, Luke Johnson, Tony Lau. Ms. Devlin. Hi there. Congratulations to Mrs. Weiniger. Um, I'm here this evening to express my support in the selection of Erin Kane as the next Douglas County School District Superintendent. Erin was a successful leader as interim superintendent from 2016 to 2018. Director Ray has even said, interim Sur superintendent Kane has been invaluable to DCSD over the past two years. She has provided great leadership during this period of transition and we greatly appreciate her service to the district. In addition to this positive remark, I read that Erin received a standing ovation from all district principals at a district leadership team meeting that happened at the end of her appointment. The fact that she founded and led exceptionally at American Academy is a tremendous accomplishment. Her record speaks for itself. We as a community need to think about making the kids in the district a top priority with a leader who can help them achieve academic ex excellence and have a bright future in a premier sought after district. I believe Erin is the most prepared to help the district pass the MLO bond that is much needed. Let's support her in the school seconds. district and focus on what's important, the students. Stop the frivolous lawsuits and planning of the majority board members recall. That money can be better spent on helping the kids instead of hurting them. Please think of the kids. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Devlin, Luke Johnson, Tony Lau, Amy Carlson, Mr. Johnson. Good evening, directors. I support candidate Erin Kane as our next superintendent of schools. <clears throat> After watching the candidate interviews and forums, I firm, firmly believe Erin Kane is the stronger candidate. Her track record as interim superintendent serves as proof that she is qualified to step into the role of superintendent and will hit the ground running. 
Erin Kane's background in engineering and data science and her data-driven approach to driving academic excellence will prove great benefit to students, teachers, and staff. I was impressed with her ideas and commitment to staff recruitment and retention at the community forum, impressed with her desire to unify our community through public outreach. Importantly, I believe Erin Kane's work and advocacy for the prior mill levy override will be quite beneficial as our community moves forward with initiatives to provide better pay, benefits, and resourcing to our valued teachers and staff. I encourage the board to finalize the hiring of Erin Kane. On a different topic regarding the recent lawsuit against the district and the preliminary injunction issued, I encourage the board to appeal the court's decision. The ruling appears to be an inventive work of judicial activism that relies upon the legal precedents of other states, but is not grounded in Colorado law. The ruling specifically states, and I quote, there is a lack of appellate seconds. decisions in Colorado regarding whether serial communications violate the Colorado open meetings law. I would further encourage citizens to take a closer look at Mr. Marshall and his motivations for filing multiple lawsuits in this county. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Tony Lau, Amy Carlson, Matthew Solak. Mr. Lau. Good evening. Good to see all of you in person. I was excited when I watched the recent board meeting when all of you voted to change the uh, compensation structure for teachers and staff. I thought we had put the past behind us that you guys all agreed. But when I watched the recent special meeting that was held in early part of March, I was disappointed that the reason for the meeting was to appeal the recently lost case in which uh, the board or certain directors were accused of uh, not abiding by the open meeting laws of Colorado. The taxpayers have already had to pay for the legal fees associated with this lawsuit. And since the district lost this case, taxpayers had to pay for the plaintiff's legal fees as well. I don't understand how appealing this case will help students or teachers. As you know, our district has had difficulty paying teachers and other staff market wages. The funds that will go towards this lawsuit, as well as other cases, only divert funds from education. Those funds could be used to pay teachers more or increase wages for all job openings that we have currently, which I believe are in the hundreds. Paying teachers more and attracting new teachers or teacher aides helps our children's education directly. Some of you have, have indicated that prior boards have met in private and made decisions and that that's a good reason for why uh, you should be able to do that now. But I ask, as we're looking at the MLO bond in November, that you would consider the decisions that you make and consider whether or not those decisions will help the district and the students. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Lau. Amy Carlson, Matthew Solak, Cynthia Fincher. Ms. Carlson. Good evening. I would like to support Ms. Hillard's comments made in the February meeting and demand public censor for public for the board members for Ray, Hansen, and Meek for violation of four separate sections of GP board members code of conduct 1.8. To that list of violations, I would like to add board file BCA-E-1 code of ethics and BCB conflict of interest. In addition, Mr. Ray must be disciplined for lack of integrity, honesty, and for violating professional standards for his long-standing misrepresentation that he is a licensed professional counsel, counseling candidate. Up until about a week ago, he held himself out as an LPCC when in fact his license expired in December of 2020. That said, I am here to encourage all the board members to regularly visit all of our schools and be reminded that you're not just in the business of managing buildings or the bodies inside the buildings. Go inside the schools and see the little faces that are our future and the faces of the adults who have committed their lives to educating our children and who might be weary and in need, in need of encouragement. Also, I encourage you to continue your loyalty exclusively to the children and your accountability exclusively to the parents. I attended the seconds. county assembly this last weekend and the warm welcome for the board members that, uh, that, um, that they received was very exciting. It raised the roof. Even Stu Parker said that it was the most enthusiastic welcome any speaker received the Thank entire you, day. Thank you, Ms. Carlson. Matthew Thank Solak, you. Cynthia Fincher, Jenny Brown. Mr. Solak. Um, 
I have serious concerns about your transparency. It was, it was wrong for you to fire Corey Wise the way you did because you acted behind everyone's back. That was wrong. That is why you have been ordered by a judge not to do that anymore. Why are you so afraid to make decisions in public? Is it because you have a political agenda and you need to make sure the majority is all on board? Are you afraid to show, show your incompetence like you displayed at the March 11th special meeting? Why is being transparent so difficult for you? It has been pretty clear that behind everyone's back, you have already decided to hire Aaron Kane. When was that decision made? How was that decision made? Why are you so set on hiring a charter school administrator to run a public school district? In order to gain unity, you need to bring stakeholders along with you, which means hearing their voices before you make your decision. While you will officially make your decision tonight, we all know the decision was made a long time ago and that the last few weeks have been an inconvenient show you need to put on to seem legitimate. I call on you to do the right thing and heal this community. Hire Danny Windsor as superintendent because he will work with all sides to do what is best for students. That is his only agenda, to do what is best for students. I also call on you to accept the district court injunction and publicly commit to conducting all school board business at public meetings. That is the right thing to do for our community and students. It shouldn't be that hard. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Solak. Cynthia Fincher, Jenny Brown, Benjamin Husser. Ms. Fincher. Board of Directors, thank you for your time and avail availability to speak to you. I understand the Douglas County School District is considering pulling my son from his current placement at the GEM Center. My first thought was that this could not be true. Where would they put him? There currently isn't an appropriate or meaningful program inside of Douglas County that can accommodate the needs of my autistic son. There has been a lot of talk over the years in special education inside of Douglas County about options for our children. Each time I'm left dismayed and angry given it seems saving money is the priority and not serving our children. Please be the first board in Douglas County history to prioritize your most vulnerable learners. Please be the board that demands your special education department stop talking about building a warehouse for our children until they age out and demand that they develop a quality evidence-based options that ensure our children's mental and physical safety, education, progress, and quality of life. Until meaningful options are provided, please stop your special education leadership from terrorizing our families by threatening to pull them from the best educational seconds. experience they've ever had, one that has kept my son safe and one where he's making progress, feeling confident and competent and one where he feels he has dignity. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Fincher. Jenny Brown, Benjamin Husser, followed by Michelle Villanueva. Good evening. I'm really tired and I don't wanna be here tonight. I'm weary, but I'm persistent and ready to speak to another group of Douglas County School District leadership. I'm used to speaking with Douglas County leadership. I do it about every six to nine months where I fight with my legal team to keep my daughter Abby at the best school she has ever been at, the GEM Center. I'm here because my daughter Abby can't tell you what she thinks. She's nonverbal, highly developmentally delayed, and autistic. If she could tell you, she would tell you how much she loves her school and the people there that have drastically changed her life for the best. She's now doing things we never expected her to do. We thought she'd never be able to use a restroom and now we're preparing to potty train her at 11 years old. The GEM staff got her to walk with minimal assistance to communicate with an electronic device to express her needs, wants, and feelings. They treat her with dignity and teach her without the use of an enclosure that she couldn't escape. I can't say the same for the school district. They put her in, an edge, in a cage, essentially. She couldn't open it, she couldn't get out on her own. Douglas County School District employees are amazing. They are loving, seconds. but they lack the training. It strikes me as odd that the Douglas County School District didn't learn its lesson with Andrew F. and that my daughter is continuing to fight the battle that he has supposedly already won. Remember de minimis? 
do the right thing. Keep our school open. Thank you, Ms. Brown, Benjamin Husser, Michelle Vill Villanueva, Marcos Delgado. Mr. Husser. I'm Jennifer Seibert speaking on behalf of Mr. Husser tonight. Um, this is from him. My son Alexander has been attending GEM for several years now after originally attending the Cherry Creek School System. I'm writing you today to extol GEM as the ideal environment for a fair and appropriate education for special needs children. While my child is not in Douglas County Schools, I wanted to share my family's experiences of GEM with you so that you may have additional perspective alongside Douglas County families that have GEM learners. My son had significant difficulties learning in the special education program at Cherry Creek, particularly during his second and third grade years. While I'm sure the educators were doing what they could for him, his social emotional state was degrading and his education was not progressing as it should. Please note, the below is not to denounce Cherry Creek nor its educators, but to provide a point of comparison to our GEM experiences. This difficulty was evidenced in multiple calls from the teacher each week where Alexander was out of sorts and not available for learning. <coughs> Regular in-person visits by me to the school to de-escalate him or take him home. Occasionally being ordered by the school to keep him home. Regular resistance to schoolwork, culminating in a full day where he sat on a beanbag refusing to work. For a student, this was not a productive learning environment. For a single parent and a workplace professional, the situation was untenable. Within one week of Alexander arriving at GEM, he advised me that he appreciated a teacher and had a good 15 day. 15 seconds. This was the first time either of these positives had been heard from in him in years. A few months in, he was having a difficult day at GEM and would not complete an assignment. GEM called, but it was not to complain or ask me to pick him up, but to ask if I could possibly call off transportation and pick him up later if the behavior continued for another hour or two, as they wanted to keep working with him. Thank you. Michelle Villanueva, Marcos Delgado, followed by Craig Adams. Ms. Villanueva. Hi there. Thank you so much for your time. Um, my 11-year-old. <laughs> Sorry, I'm gonna lose it. <laughs> My 11 year old special needs son was arrested and taken to jail with a $25,000 bond. Three weeks into middle school, he was in an effective needs classroom in Douglas County and had been for a few years. Obviously, this was extremely traumatic to my son, myself, and my family. My son continues to experience trauma, significant attendance issues, and fear of school and police. The gym center has provided me hope. My son is finally in a place he feels safe and understood. And as he receives trauma, he also receives trauma therapy at the gym center. It would be extremely detrimental if this exceptional school was not an available option to my son and children with higher support needs. I am so thankful for the gym center. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Villanueva. Marco Stolgado, Craig Adams, Emily Adams. Mr. Delgado. Okay, thank you. Craig Adams, Emily Adams, followed by Christy Leisure. Mr. Adams. Okay, is this Emily Adams? Okay, thank you, Emily. My name is Emily Adams. I came tonight from Jefferson County to tell you how important the GEM Center is, <laughs> excuse me, <laughs> especially to my daughter, Ari. Ari spent seven and a half years at a school where they valiantly attempted to give her an education. Really though, she missed all of third, fourth, and fifth grade. She spent sixth grade deeply depressed and we couldn't get her out of bed. She didn't attend school. We were so lucky because we had an amazing special education team who worked hard to find the right placement for Ari. She started at GEM in June of 2020. She was doing math and reading at about a fourth grade level at 12 years old. In less than two years, they're extremely close to having her at grade level. She's in eighth grade this year and we're working hard so that she can reach her goal of attending a regular public high school. This is entirely due to the patience and incredible work of the staff at GEM. Today, we have a happy, healthy 14-year-old with a bright future. She has a foundation that Jem has given her, and we are working on the transition back to a more typical setting. If you met her, you would say she's delightful. She is delightful. She is intelligent, 
thoughtful, caring person. She has so much to contribute. And if she loses Jem right now, I'm scared about what that will mean for her, for us, and for all of our children. I wanted to share with you her words. Jem is the first school that I have felt safe and happy at. I've never been able to go to school for so many days in a row. I finally learned how to write paragraphs correctly. I finally made a friend that I can trust and not be afraid to express myself. Thanks to Jem, I'm in a better place. Thank you, Ms. Adams. Christy Leisure, Sandra Bukowski, Jeff Bukowski. Ms. Leisure. Okay, if she is not here, Sandra Bukowski, Jeff Bukowski, followed by Rachel Yamilkowski. And I apologize if I did not get that correct. Mr. Bukowski, or Ms. Bukowski. Bukowski. <sighs> Hello, my name is Sandra Bukowski. I'm mom to G, an eighth grader who currently attends the GEM Center. G is hard, complicated, and oh, such a difficult child. She has been clearing classrooms due to behaviors since preschool and subsequently has had an out of district placement since the end of first grade. She has had so many labels, diagnoses, and they've changed over time. It's all hard to keep track of. She has been in a therapeutic environment for the majority of her life, from Children's Hospital, Mount St. Vincent, and the Joshua School. G was recently placed at her current facility, the GEM Center, by DCSD, November of last year. Jem stepped up in a big way above and beyond any of her previous placements. And what they, what they have done for G and my family in four months' time is life speed ahead of what has taken place for the last 10 years. And they know it wasn't easy. They drew the line in the sand. They did not allow her to opt out of life. They forced her through the ugliest extinction burst. She's beginning to attend academics and tend to her schedule. Prior to Jem, a simple, a simple trip as a family seconds. to get ice cream never had any good outcomes. It was awful. This spring break, she went and got ice cream and was happy. G has not done acquiring the necessary skill set nor academics to be successful as an adult. Any move from the Gem Center will be devastating. Thank you for your comments. Uh, Jeff Bukowski, Rachel Yamlokowski, uh, Yam and followed by Michael Jeff Bukowski. Okay, we will move to Rachel. My name is Rachel Yamilkoski. It doesn't matter how you say it, it's fine. Thank you. And I'm a parent of a child who is currently achieving his education in an out-of-district placement at the GEM Center. We didn't get that placement easily. We got it with, uh, through an arduous path of failed school placements, evaluations by DCSD staffs, negotiations medita uh, mediated by the Colorado Department of Education, outside evaluations, and legal advice. It's clear that our child was one of the very few who would not be successful at DCSD neighborhood schools, no matter what we tried. You will doubtless hear from many GEM parents tonight because while we are a small percentage of the population, we are entirely used to having to fight for our children's educations. If you're unaware of the role of the GEM Center fields in the community, it's a place where kids like mine who have been unable to receive an education at the neighborhood schools are sent for intensive academic and behavioral supports. In neighborhood public schools, our kids were often traumatized. All of the kids at G GEM have autism and most have other diagnoses. GEM's director, Laura Gerke, has made it her mission to embrace kids like mine and give them the support and the skills they need to learn and to grow into full and productive members of society. Our kids go to her often after being traumatized. 15 seconds. And um, we were recently alerted to the fact that our kids' placement at GEM is endangered due to internal politics. The kids who have ended up at GEM Center are especially vulnerable. I ask you to con truly consider the cost of pulling DCSD's children from GEM. The district will be legally liable. Thank you, Ms. Yamilkowski. Michael Yamilkowski. If Michael's not here, we will move to Kamaya Jenkins, Robert Logan, followed by Jim. Can I speak for Michael? You may speak for Michael. He's my husband. Thank you. He had 
to be home with our kids. Thank you, I really appreciate that. So what I wanted to say is there is not another school in Douglas County that comes near to what the tailored individual educations are that, that Jem and Laura Gerke can provide. There is not another school in the state that is able to meet the needs of these kids better than the Jem Center. That is why you will find that we, the parents of Jem, will choose this hill to die on because we have been fighting forever for these kids and we will continue to fight. I ask you to please consider the cost of pulling DCSD's children from the GEM Center. The district will be legally liable if you displace our children once again in a vain attempt to save money or to curry favor in partisan politics. Our children are owed a free and appropriate public education. The GEM Center is the only appropriate public education for our kids. Please do right by the district by doing what's right for our kids. Thank you. Thank you on behalf of Michael. Camille Jenkins, Robert Logan, followed by Jen Logan. Ms. Jenkins. I'm reading on behalf of Kamaya Jenkins. Dear esteemed directors, my name is Kamaya Jenkins and I am the mother of an autistic son who attends the GEM Center in Parker. As a mother of color, which with a child of color, my only hope is that I can, the only hope that I have is for my child's safety and security. It is every parent's nightmare to learn that your child's needs aren't met, that they're being mistreated, or that they are not safe. This nightmare became a reality for me in late uh, 2019, when I discovered that my son, who was placed in a center-based pro autism program through Douglas County, was being locked in a closet, secluded, and had his fingers smashed in the locked door. Words cannot explain the pain and fear that I felt that day and every day until finding the gym center. For the first time in a long time, my son is safe. His needs are met, but most importantly, he is happy and he's learning. My son is thriving due to the vicarious academic and therapeutic environment that Jim has created within its walls. For the first time in a long time, my son is learning. He's not afraid, he's not hiding, and he's not being abused. He's being treated like a human being, which is every child's basic right. Also, for the first time in his entire academic seconds. career, I have been able to work a full-time job without the fear of being called to pick him up on a daily basis. As a single mother, I am thriving. The gym center has quite literally saved my small but mighty family, and I am not allowed for this environment to be taken away from us. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Robert Logan, Jim Logan, followed by uh, Beth Giro. Mr. Logan. Hello, I'll keep this probably kind of short. Um, I'd like to just kind of reflect the positive experiences we've had at GEM Center, going from a neighborhood school in Parker with the police being called, destroying property, emptying classrooms, I've heard other people have mentioned these things also, to an, another placement that didn't work out. We got lucky, got placed at the GEM Center. My son went from throwing rocks at cars, destroying property, Again, having the police called and restrained to just being a great, great person. Thank you, Mr. Logan. Jen Logan. I'm also reading on behalf of Jen Logan. Um, dear esteemed directors, my name, oops, that's the wrong one, I apologize. Dear board directors, my son Jack is thriving at Gem Center in Parker. He started off his school years in a public school in Parker. We soon discovered that he had social anxiety and was acting out in class when he had to speak in school. By second grade, Jack was hiding under desks, running around school and acting out. He went to an IEP and was placed in an SED classroom. He did okay most of that year because of the teacher and student ratio was one-on-one. -on -one. Third grade was challenging and Jack acted out and was not accessing academics. The SED student to teacher ratio became much higher as more kids were attending the program. 
By the time he hit fourth grade, he was severely acting out by throwing things, running from school, and yelling, making verbal threats. The SED teachers were forced to put him in a padded and small locked room until he could calm down. He was unable to calm himself, so he would tear at the padded wall, threaten staff, and refuse to participate in school. He started trying to run home, so the school was called, um, called Parker PD most, almost daily. The assistant principal put him in her locked office seconds. and told him that the only way that he could go home would be to destroy school, school property and get suspended. He promptly destroyed her wood desk down to splintered pieces. She called Parker PD. When we arrived at the school, Jack was sitting on the ground holding a stuffed animal. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, we have Beth Garrow, Jason Garrow, followed by Jennifer Sievert. Ms. Garrow. Mr. Garrow. Okay, we'll move to Jennifer Sievert, Marshall Leaker, followed by Rachel Leaker. Jennifer Sievert. My daughter came to me from a very hard place. She's adopted from foster care. Sorry. She has several developmental disabilities, including autism, FAST, and an anxiety disorder. She has some challenging behaviors because of these disabilities and her lacking skills. She began attending gym in June of 2020 in person and before that a little bit um, through remote learning with the pandemic. But since she's been there, she's made academic progress for the first time in her life. She's improved over a grade level in reading and math. She's enjoying creative writing. She feels valued. They're part of their community, respected as an individual. She's viewed as a child who has problems due to lagging skills rather than the child who is a problem, which is what she was looked at in Douglas County Schools, where she was locked in rooms, where she was isolated from others, where she came to believe that she is stupid and worthless. I was extremely concerned to hear that the district is considering pulling kids from gym who have finally found a place where they feel like they can learn and that they're safe. And I know that this will seriously damage her mental health as well as her academics. And I'm just pleading with you to please keep these kids at gym. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Siever. Marshall Leaker, Rachel Leaker, and Tammy Stout. Mr. Leaker. Marshall, Marshall Liker, and I'm reading on behalf of him since he's home with our daughter. Um, and actually, this is going to be from my father, Lily's grandpa. To whom it may concern, my name is David Dunham, grandfather of Lily Liker. I want to write briefly in support of the GEM school and what the school has meant to the Liker family and to Lily in particular. Quite simply, it is the tale of two Lilies, the before and after Lily with the GEM school playing a pivotal role in the transformation. Before GEM entered the picture, Lily was an at-risk child in the public school system because of the severity of her autism. Her behavior and at times self-destructive behavior had escalated to becoming unmanageable, not just in the school classroom, but outside of, it in what most of us would consider normal routines, at one point requiring hospitalization. Her, school, her meltdowns at school were met with direct physical restraint that caused injury to her and those trying to restrain her. It was at this time a little over two years ago that Jim entered the picture through the Elizabeth School District. Their approach to special needs children became the dramatic turnaround that now has Lily much more socially balanced and manageable in her day-to-day -day behavior. She has learned personal coping skills that help redirect her attention as she begins to perseverate on any given matter. She can now be a coach into trying new and different things as well as working through interruptions and routine changes that previously would have resulted in a meltdown. Though I'm only familiar with Lily's story, I'm confident others have similar stories of what a difference this very special school, this very special place. Thank you. And do you have comments for Rachel Liker as well? Yes. Thank you. That is me. And I... Okay. There's a very detailed story of Lily's journey through the public school system that I could tell you about, but time won't permit it. Instead, I'll explain to you how important the GEM Center truly is. It was no accident that this organization is called GEM because that's exactly what it is, and it represents just that how to grow exceptional minds. Lily was in the public school system up until she reached middle school. 
When Lily started sixth grade, she, we had just moved to Elizabeth. Unfortunately, the SSN teachers were not equ equipped or trained to work with a child like Lily. Otherwise, they never would have put her in illegal holds on the ground for 45 minutes or longer. This went on for about six weeks until Elizabeth School District said, Lily need to be placed elsewhere. When we found Jem, it was a total godsend. Lily and I toured the center and she said verbatim, and they're not going to hold me down? It just about broke my heart. And Lily's been attending Jem now for just over two years, and it's been a tremendous growth in her behaviors. It's truly remarkable. She's now able to self-coach to calm down, and she's actually learning now because the GEM staff are so well-equipped to work with these special kids like Lily. We as special needs parents have had to advocate for our children since day one, and that's exactly what I'm doing for my daughter. She needs seconds. to stay at GEM. It's an essential part of her growth and learning. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Laker. Tammy Stout, Greg Stout, and Laura uh, Gerkel, I think it's G-E-H-R-K-E, Gerke. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm Tammy Stout. I am a 30-year vet veteran elementary teacher um, in both private and public schools. Um, our daughter is our fourth child. Um, we sent three boys through Cherry Creek School District, and I wanted to send our daughter as well. She's adopted from China. We found out she has autism and lots of other things. The SPED team at her elementary school wisely placed her somewhere else because they couldn't handle her. They weren't equipped, and they knew. She's crazy smart, but her behaviors are off the chart, off the chart. So... She got a placement at GEM Center, and we are so, so grateful. She is learning to read. She's learning to self-manage. She's learning to calm down. I don't get calls during the day to come get my child. It's really important. I can still teach neurotypical children because my daughter is in the right place. If you pull the children from Douglas County, GEM Center may close because there's not enough other kids. Please consider leaving them. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Stout, Greg Stout, followed by Laura Gerke, followed by Jeff Ellis. Ma'am, is Mr. Stout here? Okay, we will move to Laura Gerke, Jeff Ellis, followed by Michael Gross. I'm Laura Gerke. I am the founder and executive director of the GEM Center. Um, and I've spoken in front of this board years ago uh, when my daughter was in Children's Hospital um, after suffering mental and physical abuse in her public school. We went to another district. Uh, worse things happened there. And when you're home in rock bottom and no one has an option for you, you have to create one. So that is what uh, we have done. We have a very beautiful little program of 18 kids. Um, and a lot of parents here to represent what we're doing. And it was really shocking a few weeks ago um, when we found out that um, our children could potentially be pulled um, and not really being part of a, an appropriate due diligence process. Um, and so I would like to just make sure that um, there is an appropriate superintendent who will specialize or um, prioritize special education um, because we need change and our families cannot be terrorized by always feeling that we have to fight and that we're going to lose services. We have great services and I would love to partner with the district um, to have less restrictive options, but until those are available, this must be an option. Thanks. Thank you, Ms. Gerke. Jeff Ellis, Michael Gross, followed by Amber Watson, Mr. Ellis. Jeff Ellis. Okay, Michael Gross, Amber Watson, followed by Jennifer Smith. Good evening. With the board's permission, I am speak my name is Sheila. I'm speaking on behalf of my husband, Michael Gross, as well as um, Amber was listed on there, who is our co-parent, uh, Shiloh's birth mom. I would like to speak in her place as she is not here. Okay. Um, ladies and gentlemen of the board, I am not here to speak to you as board members, but as parents or as those who have a heart for the children in our community. Um, in the words of my husband, Michael, Shiloh experienced so much mental trauma 
and other negativity being bounced around the school district like a soccer ball until we found a placement and a home for him at Gem Center. And it's not just the school. It really is a second home to all the children. If you haven't gotten a chance to tour it, I implore you to. But he was bounced around. He was diagnosed with high-functioning autism at the age of four years old, um, which led to an anxiety disorder due to co-parenting and instability on the other side of the family. He experienced um, abuse physically, emotionally, other things. That led to his behavior spiraling out of control in other schools saying, we love your son. He is smart as a whip, but we do not have the appropriate facility and staff to handle him. And he was politely expelled from a few different schools until Legacy Point pushed him and us to Gem Center. Um, at the other schools, he was running away off campus because they were trying seconds. to mold him into the cookie cutter of what society thought he should be, not what he should be to society, and meeting him at his level, which has improved drastically with being at Gem Center, forming him into the brilliant, well-mannered young man that we know. And go ahead and continue okay. for Amber Watson. Thank you. Um, and with me. So <laughs> with Shiloh and Gem Center, um, it has made such a huge difference. It has positively shaped him from having um, violent outbursts and stuff to being able to control them to where he is no longer damaging property. He is no longer hurting himself, which was the biggest issue of all because when he got in trouble, he would self-discipline. And that broke my heart. Um, also with the GEM Center, it gives them a safe place to learn. It is year-round school because for children like Shiloh, remote learning did not work. We tried it. We gave it the good old college effort, but he did not have the capacity to sit on the computer and it would frustrate him and cause meltdowns. GEM gives him that one-on-one -on -one interaction that he so desperately needs, all these kids needs, and I implore you to seek that for the needs of them as well as they are a fluid school, which means they meet him at his level. If he is having a great day, he can go up to the level and he gets to go to the school and gets all these positive reinforcements and love that he needs. But if he's having a learning day, they meet him at his level, they regress him back and they say, what do you need today? We're here to help seconds. you. 15 seconds. Gem, like the name implies, for all these students have gone under pressure like carbon does to become diamonds. This school shapes these students to become the gems that this community needs to be the special voices that these community needs that are being not heard. And I implore you to keep them there. Thank you. Thank you. Jennifer Smith followed by Scott Smith. It's just me. So I'm actually not going to say much. My son Ty is at the Gem Center. He was the first student. Um, for Gem Center, and I had to unilaterally place him there myself because the district was failing my son, and he was trying to kill himself at school. Um, and I went to a IEP meeting in which they told me that his needs were being met. And I was shocked, um, and they couldn't even acknowledge uh, that they were failing him. And so I pulled Ty and I found Laura. I don't know how I found Laura, but I found Laura. Um, and Ty was their first placement and he's been there ever since. And he is back to being my beautiful, um, loving, funny, hilarious kid that he was before he was put in a series of placements that destroyed him. So um, I have too much to say to share it with you guys here. So I wrote it all down because that's what I do. So I would um, respectfully ask that you take the time to read that for me, please. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Smith. Brandy Bradley, Jim McGannon, followed by Scott J uh, Jacobson. Brandy Bradley. My heart is with the Gym Center parents, and I hope they're being heard by every board member. 
My name is Brandi Bradley. I have four boys in Douglas County Schools. Parents using fake names on social media, keyboard warriors, friends of the previous board continue to attack myself and others because we have stood up to speak and protect our children. Then they block us from their groups and continue to slander and defame, giving us no opportunity to respond. We all have differences of opinion, but supporters of the previous board that lost the election continue to push the divisiveness, ugliness, and outright lies. Some of your supporters have said this about me. She is volatile and ignorant. She is an angry little elf. Ignorant, continue drinking your white Christian nationalist Kool-Aid. Q follower, racist. Because not only are you anti-union, your actions and words have placed you quite solidly in the anti-teacher camp. My sister is a teacher and so are most of my friends. Their children are off limits, but ours are not. Owen Wicks can be targeted with words like he's committed a hate crime, he's a bully, he's a Nazi, he's a liar. And at a mass choice rally, they can say, we hope your kids die from COVID, or we hope they can't get a hospital bed. And the most atrocious one so far is after seeing a picture of my deceased daughter, I quote, wow, what a wonderful role model you are for your children. No wonder you lost your last one. Seconds. Brought by the party of inclusion, love, and kindness. Hire Aaron Kane, an established leader with the most experience, return to civil discourse and leave the slander and name calling behind for the sake of our county, you guys. Thank you, Ms. Bradley. Jim McGannon, Scott Jacobson, Stacy Jacobson, Mr. McGannon. Okay, I do not see Mr. McGannon here. Scott Jacobson, Stacy Jacobson. Uh, followed by someone who signed up as Mike from Harvey Incorporated. I will not give the rest of the email if they are here. So, Mr. Jacobson. And Mr. Jacobson, uh, Stacy Jacobson has yielded your time. So, we'll stop you at 1.30 and we'll reset the clock. Thank you for the opportunity. Wow, I don't even feel right speaking after hearing all the need from the Gemini Center. Um, I'm a Douglas County resident of 20 years, proud husband, parent of a second grader in the district. I'd like to focus on two issues tonight. One, to vo voice my support and admiration for the new board who fight every day for our children, the district, and our community at large. This fresh new blood and earnest engagement in the community and with most importantly with the parents is exactly what this divided community needs. We hear a lot of personal attacks and character exec and character assassinations in the partisan local news and the social media, but rarely do the dissenters offer any specific examples or any constructive engagement upon the battlefield of ideas, only platitudes and ad hominem attacks. This tells me that the new board is directly over the target. Number two, uh, I'm here to um, uh, express my support for Ms. Kane as the new superintendent. I was very impressed with her extensive experience starting the American Academy uh, Charter School in her efforts to expose children to science and math. She's been a part of the district for 22 years with interim superintendent, superintendent experience in 2016 to 18. Uh, in that time, she reduced teacher and staff turnover down seven seconds. points with school leader turnover down 15 points. Uh, I believe she has a significant heart for the district and is well versed in the financials the operations and the academic aspects of the Douglas County School District. She's focused on putting kids first in everything we do. Thank you, Mr. Jacobson. We'll reset your time and you may continue. I think perhaps the best example of leadership in our very worst times is that Ms. Kane provided true leadership through the pandemic, including keeping her school open full time and in person for in-person learning throughout 20, 2020 and 2021 while maintaining full support of parents and staff even though they had divided the views. 92% of the staff and 95% of the parents reported being comfortable with her pandemic response. Uh, furthermore, teacher turnover in her school district during 2021 was at 8% at American Academy versus 14% for the district overall. So looking at uh, student staff and recruitment and retention. I believe she has an excellent plan and she's detailed how she'll provide better pay for teachers from teachers to bus drivers as Douglas County uh, compensation is currently near the bottom. She's talked about creating standards such as every third grader can read by third grade, which I think is admirable. Uh, and she talks about pathways for our kids in workforce readiness, whether that be um, really looking to provide opportunities so every child can have a career and not just a job, whether that be their interest in culinary to cybersecurity. Ms. Kane has already had the job for two years. She's done exceptionally well, and she's a pr proven leader that we seconds. desperately need right now. 
And most importantly, between all the interviews, Ms. Kane is the only candidate who mentioned parents as the key stakeholders in the education process. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Jacobson, and for Mrs. Jacobson. We have, again, Mike signed up. First part of the email is Harvey. I don't know if they are present. Oh, we do have Mr. Mike. Thank you. Uh, thank you, board, for the time. Um, much like everybody else here, our hearts are breaking. I, I obviously don't know what's going on with the GEM program, but um, kudos for whoever was in charge of scheduling tonight and allowing all of those GEM parents to speak in a row so that obviously important message wasn't lost on everybody because I think a lot of people's eyes were woken up by, I think I heard 18 students, but you know, a big impact. Um, sadly, other specialized programs such as the online ECDSD program, which houses over 600 full-time students, <clears throat> have had their funding pulled by the state as well, not by this board, and I don't know how, how that applies to the GEM program either. The online offering supported students with a wide variety of needs such as mental health and many others, and all those parents and families of the 600 students are gonna be displaced at the end of this school year. This past year has shown us one thing, is that we need a variety of solutions, and I implore the new board and hopefully Aaron to look into this and, and, and drive for those solutions. Um, my other comments tonight were about the Sunshine Law and I think enough things have been spoken, but what I would like to end with is a request seconds. that debate is brought back as a mandatory curriculum because I think with anything I've realized now, man, everybody needs to learn to argue and understand both sides of the of the argument and and that's lost on everybody from kids to parents thank you for your comments <laughs> judy bramberg aaron saracino followed by tina stroman i do not see miss bramberg here oh there she is coming thank you Thank you. I got so wrapped up in those uh, testimonials from the gem that I didn't even hear my name. Okay, I'm speaking in support of President Peterson and the full board who are legally conducting public, public business tonight in compliance with the Colorado Open Meetings laws with agenda items number 19 and 20 regarding retention of legal counsel. I commend President Peterson and the full board for using a resolution, a motion, and a public vote so that these actions are transparent for the community. Conversely, on December 9th, 2021, the minority board of Hanson, Meek, and Ray took formal action outside of a public meeting, conducted public business privately, retained counsel, and then appealed the Brandberg and John Dewey Institute case to the Colorado Supreme Court secretly without a resolution, without a motion, without a public vote, without a brie even briefing the newly elected full board of directors and without transparency of the community. Hanson, Meek, and Ray are guilty of doing what they have falsely accused Myers, Peterson, Williams, and Weiniger of doing, conducting public business privately. Therefore, we ask the board to settle the JDI case without further litigation, seconds. grant charter approval, and stop wasting thousands of dollars in legal fees, which should be spent on kids. Hanson, Meek, and Ray must be held accountable for these egregious and unauthorized private business practices. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Brandberg. Aaron Saracino, Tina Stroman, followed by Will Johnson. Board members, thank you for hearing me. Our nine-year-old son, who turns 10 today, Owen, has autism. His experience in Douglas County Schools was of ongoing trauma, and he received no education. We were expected to pick him up daily, often uh, just after an hour. In his last school district, he was taunted by the teacher, restrained, and locked in a small seclusion room. 
On his last day of school, when he was eight years old, his teacher set him up, restrained him, secluded him, called the police, and he was, he was arrested and taken to Children's Hospital. We were supposed to be notified within 10 minutes. We were not notified until he was almost already there. The GEM Center has saved Owen. He has progressed in ways that we thought were never possible. He now loves going to school. His escalations have dropped from at least once daily to every few months. He comes home excited, describing what he had learned this day, something he never did at the uh, Douglas County Schools, at public schools. He's finally getting an education. Owen has made so much progress, but he was not ready to step into an environment that has left him so traumatized that he could not eat, sleep, seconds. or function otherwise. Until he started at GEM, he has a lot to do before going back to public. We cannot say enough about the GEM Center as parents. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Saraceno. Tina Stroman, Will Johnson, followed by Anthony Hartsook. Ms. Stroman. Good evening, directors. Once again, thank you for having me tonight as a parent and as an educator in Douglas County. A huge shout out to the GEM School. Um, what brings me here is a sentence I heard at the Superintendent Community Forum. That sentence referenced that Douglas County Schools needs to get out of the news. I am here to remind you that the lack of ethics of this majority board is what is keeping Douglas County Schools in the news. The first unethical move was gathering together to make a decision about the fate of our leader behind closed doors. The second ethical, unethical move was then firing said superintendent for no reason without allowing public comment. The third unethical move was contacting Erin Kane to encourage her to apply for a job that didn't yet exist. She joined your unethical behavior by sending a message to the superintendent of his current contract and also agreed to apply for the job that didn't yet exist. Your most recent unethical move is appealing a decision handed down from a judge who simply directed you to follow the law. You are establishing a pattern of unethical behavior, one that is very obvious to any reasonable Douglas County citizen. I can tell you that everyone is watching, and I can assure you that there is one candidate the majority of educators support, and that candidate is Danny Windsor. If you have any hope of gaining teacher support, you need to change your pattern and make an ethical decision. 15 seconds. Hire Mr. Danny Windsor. He is your hope for passing an MLO. He is your hope in reestablishing respect in this district, and he is the hope in being the leader that students and teachers will respect and follow. Doing anything different will, keep, will give reason for Douglas County Schools to continue to be in the news. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Stroman. Will Johnson, Anthony Hartsook, Denise Dirks. Those are moving messages we heard earlier, uh, and just what a, what a powerful testament for parent choice. Um, good evening. In a 2017 article, Director Ray said that he was, quote, very pleased with Aaron Kane's performance as interim superintendent, adding that, quote, we couldn't have done better. And I can understand why he thought that. It's a testament to the board's priorities that they selected Kane as a finalist. Her ability to improve academic results, increase teacher retention, and drive fiscal responsibility are all things that we can agree DCSD needs right now. And the facts, not narratives, are what should matter. And the reality is that Erin Kane has already shown that she delivers on what matters most. In her time as interim superintendent, she played a key role in improving academic performance in DCSD across the board, including strong gains for English language learners, free reduced lunch students, and students with disabilities. She also improved the culture for our teachers, reducing uh, both teacher and school leader turnover significantly. She identified over $20 million in annual savings that could be redirected to schools and teachers. She has a proven track record of elevating this district in ways that matter to all of us. Perhaps the most compelling comment from the article is that Director Ray especially cited Kane's strength in building seconds. relationships, something I think we agree is paramount right now. So let's choose Aaron Kane as our next superintendent. If we make that choice, in Director Ray's words, we couldn't have done better. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Anthony Hartsook, Denise Dirks, Kurt Stroman. Good evening, my name is Anthony Hartsook. I'm a businessman, a combat veteran, a husband, but most importantly, I'm a father of two boys. 
One is in high school and one is in middle school. We supported Erin Kane when she was the acting superintendent and we support her today. Nearly two years ago, my 15 year old son at the time was able to see that the policies and the mandates of the previous school board and the superintendent were failing the students and the parents. My son came to me and said, Dad, this will not get me into college, and it certainly won't get him into West Point. So he started researching on his own, and we ended up transferring the boys, and they went into private schools. Our other son in middle school was on an IEP. He was below grade level. They are now thriving and excelling. He's been in the honors program. They are doing much better with choice. This last election, parents voted overwhelmingly for this school board, and we need to support Aaron Kane to bring back common sense into this district. Thank you. 15 seconds. Thank you, Mr. Hutzlick. Denise Dirks, Kurt Stroman, followed by Kara Clark. Denise Dirks. While those are being passed out, if I could just say as a parent of a child with special needs, I think this gym center needs to be looked into and I will make it my mission to look into it and make sure that these kids stay there. It's not what I'm speaking on, but okay. Speaking Directors, I sent each of you an email yesterday about the complaint I filed with Dora against a sitting board member. While the elected board secretary did acknowledge my email, I've not heard back from anyone else. Therefore, I brought the email and the attachments for your review. On February 25th, David Ray's bio on DCSD's website said he, quote, is a registered psychotherapist, or LPCC. Email communications received via Cora showed David using the LPCC after his name as of February 6th. Yet the state licensing website showed one classification expired in 2016 and one in 2020. His online bio was changed shortly after the complaint was filed. Claiming to be a registered psychotherapist, LPCC, is misleading even if the license had not expired. It stands for a licensed professional candidate, counselor candidate, and it appears that David did not advance his candidacy towards a completed certification. The person I spoke to at Dora said at this point David would need to comply, completely start the process over. And I am familiar with this as a former certified financial planner because when that expired, when I stayed home with seconds. my kids, I had to stop using that designation and I did. Director Ray, you need to publicly explain these misrepresentations. And as a district of the uh, resident of the district you represent, I do call for your resignation. David Thank Lay you, Ms. Dirks. Kurt Stroman, Kara Clark, followed by Kimberly Sharp. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you. My name is Kurt Stroman, and I have three children who have reaped the benefits of our DCSD neighborhood schools. I have also spent my entire career, over 30 years, as an educator in Douglas County, and I'm not a member of the teachers union. My request tonight comes from the four newly elected members of the board to simply begin a path forward towards restoration with the teachers and staff of our schools. The people that work with the students every day in the classroom need a leader that is best equipped to understand those needs and have them and have the knowledge and, and, and the, have the knowledge to support those needs. Danny Windsor has demonstrated himself as an educator, a coach, and a counselor and also as an administrator. He has provi provided the, his knowledge and leadership in the neighborhood and charter arena. He possesses his degrees in the field of education. He is an award-winning educator, coach, and administrator. He is respected by all who have worked with him. Tonight is your opportunity to build a bridge and mute some of the madness that has been the unfortunate headline of our district recently. Many teachers like myself who have poured every ounce of the best of ourselves into our students in this district for many years would appreciate and welcome a decision that is not stained by controversy and corruption. 
Hiring Danny Windsor is not only the best decision, but more importantly, for the sake seconds. of our district, hiring Danny Windsor is the most ethical and honest decision you could make. Tonight, you will be defined by your actions. As someone who has made every effort to be an ambassador for the reputation of this district for 30 years, I urge you to stifle the controversy and do the honorable thing by hiring Mr. Windsor. Thank you, Mr. Stroman. Kara Clark, Kimberly Sharp, followed by Liz Wagner. Ms. Clark. I wasn't sure you are going to be able to see me over the podium. They say it takes a village to raise a child. As I am a single mom of four children, I can personally attest to the truthfulness of this statement. Extended family, neighbors, friends, teachers, administrators, coaches, and church family have provided support and influence over my children. Ultimately, they are my children, and I decide what is best for them in all aspects of their lives. My children started attending Doug Coast Schools in 2015, and during the first few years, they had a successful public education. Since about 2019, I noticed a decline in the quality of their education, and more often I was having to intervene on issues that don't belong in the classroom. I'm not gonna try and pinpoint the source of the problem, but there are far too many examples of behaviors that do not belong as a part of children's education. For these reasons, I'm advocating for Aaron Kane for our next superintendent. After careful consideration, I believe Aaron to have a proven track record of working to create a better district. Her leadership as interim superintendent demonstrated fiscal responsibility, dedication to promoting a positive culture, solutions to issues large and small, overall improvement to our district academic standings. Additionally, her leadership at Academy Charter School speaks seconds. for itself. I have heard so many amazing things about Aaron working with parents to find solutions for their children. We all want what is best for our children, and they all have different needs and abilities and their desires to achieve these goals. So I am for Aaron Kane for superintendent. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Clark. Kimberly Sharp, Liz Wagner, then Randy Curtis. That will be the end of our in-person comments. We will then take a short recess and then we will move to the uh, Zoom commenters. Ms. Sharp. Hi, my name is Kimmy Sharp and I am a proud teacher at, as, at, I'm the Klimt, sorry. I'm a proud, proud to teach instrumental music at Cimarron Middle School in Parker. Um, I also have four, four kids in Douglas County Schools. Teaching is a heart career. It's something we do because we care about our students. And I would like to thank all seven of you for coming together and voting to enact the new salary schedule. That is a validation that teachers matter and are valued here. I would also like to personally thank Director Ray for attending our DCSD Middle School Honor Band and Orchestra concert in February. Actions speak loud. I encourage you all to keep getting into our schools to show support and see the wonderful things that are happening. When all of the challenges happened with COVID, we as teachers and administrators had to work together to figure things out. I truly think it would be beneficial to you all and ultimately to our district if you can turn down the volume on all of the outside interest groups and political entities. Use each other, those of us working directly with students and parent polls to help determine what would be best for our students. I implore you to always talk more with each other about the direction seconds. of our district than outside interest groups. Answer questions directly and honestly. I'm still unclear what the new direction of the district is and that's a hard place for me to be. Please keep all taxpayer finances going solely to education and the kids. Thank you for your time and your effort. Thank you, Ms. Sharp. Liz Wagner, followed by Randy Curtis, then a short recess, and first three up in remote will be Constance Ingram, Lucy Squire, and Tiffany Baker. Ms. Wagner. Good evening. I, uh, I hope you're all listening to those strong and courageous parents who spoke about the GEM Center tonight. And if you think out-of-district placements are expensive, imagine the cost of a class action lawsuit. Uh, this district is in desperate need of a superintendent who will course correct the special education legal departments. Did you know that your SPED department has a director without an appropriate license? People in glass houses shouldn't throw stones. Um, this evening, we heard how many CE credits have been earned in DCSD and the thousands of dollars that parents have saved in college tuition. However, students can't access CE classes if they can't read. And if your child can't read and isn't, achieving, isn't receiving evidence-based instruction in school, 
then um, go, when going to uh, school, then how in the world are they going to be able to afford the, the cost of uh, thousands of dollars a year for private tutoring, presuming they can afford that. Currently, only 43% of our K-3 educators have completed the training across the district required by law uh, by August 1st. We stand to lose sizable per pupil and read act funding if this is not completed by August. This isn't an educator failure. This is a leadership failure. 15 Ten seconds. Tonight you'll select a superintendent. One of your choices is an EDOS who is responsible for the principals in his region. The completion rate for this required training in the Parker region is the lowest of the entire district, coming in at 37%. For a district whose board had prioritized literacy. Thank you, Ms. Wagner. Randy Curtis will be our last live speaker. When we go remote, it'll be Constance Ingram followed by Lucy Squire. Ms. Curtis. Uh, thank you. As an advocate, I've had the opportunity to work with Laura Gerke, and I just wanted to say some of those stories that you heard tonight could not be more devastating. Like, what you heard tonight is so true, and we need to keep that school open because that is saving our district so much money. Um, I'm going to talk about literacy tonight. <clears throat> In 2019, the Colorado Department of Education recognized that over 60% of Colorado students were reading below grade level. They also recognized that teacher prep programs and universities were not preparing teachers by using 40 uh, plus years of research, which is commonly known as the science of, science of reading. Sorry, I hate doing this. Um, a bill was passed, and that bill was SB 19199. The bill requires that by August 1st, all teachers that are teaching K through third uh, learn how to use science of reading. Um, I want to thank the following principals for their support to their teachers in learning the science of reading. There are only eight schools in our district who have completed 75% of that requirement. I want to first thank Cherry 15 Valley. 15 seconds. El Dorado Ele uh, Elementary, Buffalo Ridge Elementary, Frontier Valley uh, Elementary, Rock Ridge Elementary, Castle Rock Elementary, and Roxboro uh, Intermediate and Trailblazer. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Curtis. We will now take a five minute recess. The time is 9.55. We will start at 10 o'clock again, at which point we will transition to our online commenters.
Thank you. We will move to Lucy Squire, Tiffany Baker, followed by Robert Marshall. Ms. Squire, are you online? Yes, can you hear me? We can, go ahead. I have been a teacher in this district for 17 years. The special meetings that have been called by the new board president and the meetings in which public comment have not been allowed are eerily similar to the way the past reform boards did business. Teachers throughout the district were fleeing. I'm alarmed at the patterns I'm beginning to see now with teachers already leaving, combined with the number of job openings currently posted. What we need now after two years of pandemic teaching is stability in our leadership. We don't all have to believe in the same things or have the exact same vision. Differences and conversations and working through these things is what keeps us all moving forward, but in alignment. And while it's valid that new leadership comes with newly elected officials, it's unrealistic that we get a new superintendent with every election cycle. There needs to be a way to find the stability in district leadership. We have continued to show up, the teachers and school staff, and we demand that you show up with us and work with us. To the majority board members, you have work to do to prove that you're here for the right reasons. I heard multiple times from the majority directors in the meeting on Friday the 11th that you firmly believe you've done nothing wrong and wish to continue fighting this court battle. This is a prime example of how you may not understand or want to accept the preliminary injunction by the judge, but what he has shown you is the clear line in which seconds. you must conduct business. Continuing to move forward at the expense of the district shows us that not only are you unwilling to reflect upon your past conduct, but that you are not in this to actually put kids first. If your reasons for being here are anything but to actually put kids first, then I'm afraid our reasons for concern are... Thank you, Ms. Squire. Next is Tiffany Baker, Robert Marshall, followed by Tina De Los Santos. Ms. Baker, are you online? Yes, I'm reading for a teacher. As a teacher who has been in the district since 2005 during the last reform board under the direction of Liz Fagan, much of what is going on right now feels very familiar. Huge changes were implemented that did not help students or teachers. Those changes were made without teacher input. Teachers are with students every day and our most valuable resource when it comes to improving student achievement. Why don't you want to tap into this resource? When teachers feel disrespected by the board and parents, it becomes a hostile work environment. Becky, you were a teacher during those times. How did it make you feel when teachers were not valued or consulted regarding all the changes that were made to us? I personally know many teachers who have interviews in neighboring districts and are leaving if they can. There is a huge sense of anxiety in teachers because the four majority members keep saying that they want to take the district in a new direction. Yet you never tell us what that is. It is hard to just focus on teaching when there is so much chaos at the district level. Spending district money when there is so much, I'm sorry, on frivolous lawsuits, which will take money out of the general fund for all our students is not putting kids first, nor is evaluating teachers. You ran on a platform of taking politics seconds. out of the school board. And it seems everything you've done so far is purely based on politics. What have you done for the kids? Hiring Aaron Kane will only further divide our community. This teacher fully supports Danny Windsor for superintendents as a bridge to unite our community. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Baker. We have Robert Marshall, Tina De Los Santos, followed by Lisa Freeman. Is Ms. Marshall, Mr. Marshall online? He is not Okay, we will move to Tina De Los Santos, Lisa Freeman, Margaret Furlow. Is Ms. De Los Santos online? I am. Good evening. First, and congratulations, Kaylee, and you look marvelous, and thank you for your dedication. Um, and also, after hearing all from all the parents of Jim, I hope that we can really work to help support their children. I'm horrified at the stories that I've heard over the last two years about the special education department. So I hope that that can become a priority of cleaning up and meeting the needs of the children in this district. The real reason for my comments tonight, though, is support of Erin Kane. She will provide the stability and help bridge the gap between the parents and the teachers. Parents are at the table now, and we need somebody that can help bridge the gap between the teachers and the parents. And she has proven time and time again that she listens to everybody and she can help turn a negative culture around. Her resume is extensive, and I think that you could not go wrong with her. And I think that the teachers that are scared about not knowing the direction of the district, I think it's pretty loud and clear. It's academic excellence, and it's having parents have a seat at the table for their own children. Thank you. 
Thank you, Ms. De Los Santos. Lisa Freeman, Margaret Furlow, Triana Burdick. Is Ms. Freeman online? Ms. Freeman is not online, sir. Okay, Margaret Furlow, Triana Burdick, Julie Watkins. Is Ms. Furlow online? Can you hear me? We can, go ahead. Last meeting, I commented on the urgency for the MLO to be passed. Your current actions indicate you have no interest in working towards this. Pursuing an appeal to the judge's order to follow the law communicates to taxpayers you would rather spend money in court than in classrooms. Why would this encourage the public to pass the MLO? This litigation was brought forth by a community member in order to hold our elected officials accountable. Now please just go forward and conduct public business in public. Secondly, I thought we wanted to keep politics out of the classroom. Somehow, I only know the political affiliations of the kids' first directors. Attending political events where homophobic comments are made sends a message to our LGBTQ community that we are not valued, and that is the exact reason we need the equity policy. Finally, I would like to express my support for Danny Windsor as our next superintendent. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Furlow, Triana Burdick, Julie Watkins, Megan Dahlgren. Ms. Burdick, are you online? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? Go ahead. I'm reading for a teacher tonight. A couple months ago, I would have stood up and spoken directly to you as a teacher. Now watching the actions of the four of you, you have shown you simply can't be trusted. When you try to put a bond MLO on the ballot, do not even try to blame it on anyone but yourselves when it doesn't pass. Who in their right mind would trust you with any amount of money? The four of you have single-handedly destroyed the option of a bond MLO being successful. Unfortunately, I truly do think that is exactly your plan, to choke this once amazing district out with a lack of funds. You have already shown in firing Corey that you are simply unable to uphold your responsibility to be fiscally responsible as directors. Now you are yammering about an appeal on a court case that didn't go your way. How about you just acknowledge you did something wrong, learn from it, and stop this idea of using money meant for kids to save your selfish pride? That is what I teach my students. You make a mistake, but then a true sign of character is that you own it, learn from it, and move on. Speaking of that court case, word has it that you were offered free of charge the chance to truly understand sunshine rules, and you refused to, to take the free offer. Why? You quite obviously don't understand what you have done. 15 and what seconds. You case in point, the fact that you have denied another three-day CORA request by withholding the DCSD's insurance litigation policy and the obvious evidence of redacting elements of the legal bill from Trackman. How about you start acting within the law? Thank you, Ms. Burdick, Julie Watkins, Megan Dahlgren, followed by Margarita Fiducia. Ms. Watkins, are you online? Yeah, can you guys hear me? We can, go ahead. I'm speaking on behalf of the teacher who has been teaching for 22 years and 17 of them in the Douglas County School District. I remember when DCSD was the place teachers wanted to be. Now they leave, now they leave if they can and we have lost so many good ones. The thing about teachers is that we want students to be successful in our classrooms and the top two things proven to positively affect student achievement are teacher collaboration time and small class sizes. Corey Wise was working hard to get teachers more collaboration time, even asking schools to build this into our schedules for next year. Please don't take this time away now that you're moving the district in a new direction. If anything, you could expand it by allowing teachers who are singletons in their building to collaborate across the district on professional development days. And by the way, the union is who fought for the small class sizes, something we haven't seen in DCSD since the collective bargaining agreement was allowed to lapse. Another key element that helps students engage in our classrooms is feeling seen. I had a transgender student who was the sweetest, kindest person and dropped out of school because of bullying and no support from administration. When students are in a welcoming and supportive environment, they engage in our classrooms and in our subject material. When they don't feel valued, they don't attend class or engage with the materials. When a student comes seconds. to me with their preferred pronouns and how can I possibly turn them away? My job is to make students feel loved and supported so that they can learn. And the equity policy help these marginalized students feel that. And as you review that policy, I beg that you include these students in that discussion. And finally, as a teacher, I want to voice my... Thank you, Ms. Watkins, Megan Dahlgren, Margarita Fiducia, followed by Robin Miller. Ms. Dahlgren, are you online? 
I am. Can you hear me? We can. Go ahead. Thank you all for passing the new salary schedule. Please continue working together. As the presentation said, compensation is still less than neighboring districts. We've worked to dig out of this compensation hole since the reformer years, and we're not done yet. DCSD teacher pay remains below market. Here in one of the 10 richest counties in all of America, we choose to pay our teachers lower than almost everywhere else in America. I beseech you, choose Danny Windsor as our superintendent to bridge the divide within our community. Let's move forward together as a district, as a community, fund our schools, not lawyers. Don't engage in divisive political antics the dysfunctional pitfalls, which we're still striving to recover from after nearly a decade from the reformer board. Please choose the middle, choose who truly puts kids first, choose Danny Windsor. Embrace public education as an essential community asset. Be leaders for our education system, not a catalyst to destroy public education in America. Show you mean kids first, Protect their public education. 15 seconds. Don't ask us to pass an MLO with your lawyer's bill in tow. DCSD teachers have been discounting their billable hours for over a decade. Fund our schools, not lawyers. I take a vote. Thank you, Ms. Stahlgren, Margarita Fiducia, Robin Miller, followed by Ursula Kekos. Ms. Fiducia, are you, are you online? Can you hear me? We can hear you, go ahead. Okay, thank you. I'm um, reading a teacher's anonymous comment. I am a 15 year veteran elementary teacher of the Douglas County School District. I am staying anonymous this evening for a couple of reasons. One, reformer boards retaliate. And two, I'm not looking to be attacked by an angry parent. Be called the devil or be left out of a lunch delivery because I believe in and will stand up for our neighborhood schools. Board majority, I am appalled by the circus you have created. It's not even necessarily about the decisions you are making, it's how you are making them. A different viewpoint is one thing. Going about implementing new ideas the way you have been is quite another. Slow down, be respectful, follow the law, keep your political shenanigans out of our schools, stop speaking at political events, listen to your clientele. A majority of public comment is against your far right agenda. Students and teachers have been very vocal with their input, yet you continue to not acknowledge us. Board veterans, thank you for showing up to a ridiculous amount of unorganized, unethical special meetings and continuing to be a voice of reason. Your knowledge and expertise is appreciated and valued. Board directors, all of you, I have a few suggestions for you. Although I suspect your decisions were made a while ago, hire Danny Windsor, a nonpartisan choice who would represent all of Douglas County in a positive manner. Sign yourselves up for seconds. some board training. You skip CASB and have declined other opportunities and it is glaringly apparent that it is desperately needed. Do not appeal the judge's decision to simply follow the law. And last, but definitely not least, bring back boring. Thank you for your time. Thank you. We now have Robin Miller, Ursula Kakos, followed by Bobby Hillard. Is Ms. Miller online? Good evening. Can you hear me? We can. Go ahead. Great, uh, thank you and good evening. I'm here to voice my support for Danny Windsor as DCSD superintendent. Not only is his career experience far more suitable for the job, but his hiring does not continue the theme of dishonesty, collusion, and premeditated political planning on the part of the Kids First board members. While I also have the floor, please support the families and the children of the GEM school. Additionally, I'd like to list a few additional themes of the Kids First board members. Firstly, you're wasting taxpayer money on lawsuits and contractual salaries paid when Superintendent Wise was unjustly released. Second, the great division you've created within the community based on political motivations and power-hungry behaviors. Thirdly, you are the epitome of deceitful, dishonest, and underqualified elected officials. Please do what is right hire Danny Windsor for the position and discontinue the unethical practices that you've been engaging in. Thank you. Thank you. We now have Ursula Kakos, Bobby Hillard, followed by Brett Bradford. Ms. Kakos, are you online?
Ms. Kakos, can you hear us? Hello? Yep, we can hear you. Go ahead. Oh, great. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you all for volunteering your time for our community. I wanted to first put my support forward for Erin Kane, who is an outstanding leader. I think we would be blessed to have her. I also wanted to address my disappointment in the minority board to go forward with this lawsuit in our district, costing us even more money. Our focus should be on the importance of children getting an education, not petty lawsuits. Your supporters are always asking the majority members to let go of things, not move so fast. Maybe it's time you let go. If you're so concerned with the money in our district and how it's spent, maybe you should let go of this lawsuit. No one's gonna sign up for any type of levy if you keep spending money. Show the district that our children and teachers come first, not your political agendas. You had years of being able to do whatever you wanted with basically no oversight or accountability. And now that it's been taken away from you, you won't put your attention where it's needed. It's strictly about destroying the voted opposition. Even at the beginning of the school year, when our children were forced to wear masks, Douglas County formed their own health board and he brought a lawsuit against saying that special needs children wanted and needed masks. Who did you even speak to to get this opinion? No one came to me to ask me about my son. Thank you very much. Thank you. We have Bobby Hillard, Brett Bradford, followed by Tracy Jones. Ms. Hillard, are you online? I am. Can you hear me? We can. Go ahead. Perfect. I want to share my support of Erin Kane. We've already heard several, several comments about all of her accomplish, accomplishments. Sorry about that. Many for our own district, so I have a quick story to share instead. I was fortunate to hear Ms. Kane speak about a year ago. And to be honest, as she spoke about how she handled the COVID situation at her charter school, I was actually near tears thinking about all of the remote learning, masks, and other BS my own students were forced to endure. I was sad that my kids were too old for American Academy, and I was wondering why couldn't Erin Kane have stayed on as the permanent superintendent after serving in a temporary capacity and making so many achievements in her short time with us. But now we have a chance to bring her back and the choice couldn't be more clear. It's a resounding yes vote to select Aaron Kane. No offense to Mr. Windsor and I thank him for his time and his interest. But to be honest with Aaron Kane in the running, I don't think there could actually be a better candidate for a DCSD superintendent. It looks like I actually agree with David Ray. Uh, with my few remaining seconds, I'd also like to echo the Wicks family's request that the entire board make a unified seconds. message denouncing the online bullying of a minor and any minor by adults. Finally, I appreciate the board teaching our children to stand up for the truth and for what is right. Thank you all. Thank you, Ms. Hillard. Brett Bradford, Tracy Jones, followed by Alexa Connor. Brett Bradford, are you online? Yes, not online, sir. Tracy Jones, Alexa Connor, and then Lisa Franklin. Ms. Jones, are you online? I am. Can you hear me? We can. Go ahead. Thanks. Um, first of all, I wanted to congratulate Director Weininger on the new little precious little bundle of joy. Um, second, I wanted to say as an engaged parent and as a member of the PTO, I am asking that you offer the position of superintendent to Danny Windsor. I believe he would be the best fit for our community and a great leader. I have heard great things from many people who have worked with him and past students that have had him. Um, as a counselor. Please choose Danny Windsor to help bridge this divisive gap as only he, I believe, will be able to do. Have you, as you've heard, most teachers are putting their support for Danny Windsor. So if you are really for the teachers, um, then you will side with him and with the teachers. Um, also, in the best interest of the CSD community, um, I'm just asking that this appeal process be put to rest um, and that we just simply adhere to the injunction that was put in place um, and to get that money sent to schools and to the kids and to the teachers. Um, thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Ms. Jones, Alexa Connor, Lisa Franklin, followed by Michelle Wolf. Ms. Connor, are you online? She is not online, sir. Lisa Franklin, Michelle Wolf, 
And then Casey Nice, Miss Franklin, are you online? Yes, I am. Go ahead. Good evening, directors. Good evening, directors. My name is Lisa Franklin, and I'm speaking on behalf of a DCSD teacher who has served our district for over 10 years. These are her words. I have been teaching in Douglas County neighborhood schools, and for as long as I can remember, there has been an us versus them mentality between neighborhood schools and charter schools. While I am not opposed to choice for families in our district, I am opposed to the extreme division in our district between charter and neighborhood schools. That is why I'm asking you to appoint Danny Windsor as the next superintendent in DCSD. I am gravely concerned about what will happen in this district should Erin Kane be named superintendent. During her interview, Ms. Kane made multiple concerning comments, including giving an example saying, quote, after I left the district. Ms. Kane did not leave the district. She moved to another position within our district. By referring to leaving the district after her role as interim superintendent, it is apparent that she does not see both communities as part of DCSD. As a teacher, I am concerned that Ms. Kane will further divide our community rather than bringing us together. I am extremely concerned that Ms. Kane will not support me, my students, and the families in our neighborhood schools, as she clearly does not hold them in the same regard as American Academy. I implore seconds. you to appoint Mr. Windsor as our next superintendent. His experience in our neighborhood schools, as well as director of choice programming, makes him the most qualified candidate to unify and lead our district moving forward. Thank you. Thank you. We now have Michelle Wolf, Casey Nice, followed by Stephanie Chancy. Ms. Wolf, are you online? Yes. Go ahead. I'm reading tonight for a teacher. I have been a Douglas County teacher for over 15 years. Through good and bad, I have remained because of the relationships I have cultivated with my administrators, colleagues, local families, and mostly my students. While I have been tempted many times, particularly in the first reform years, to take jobs elsewhere in the state, a special and really intangible bond with my school and its community has kept me in place. While I would like to address the board and the agenda items, I primarily want to say a huge thank you to the many, many parents who have gone out of their way to really support teachers during these tougher times in education. Families are working to care for us, including small notes of gratitude, hot coffee on cold mornings, and gift cards. Additionally, and in a really inspirational way to support us, they are volunteering service hours in the form of organizing and communicating on our behalf, since we do not feel safe or protected without a bargaining agreement. The parents of our students are treating us with kindness and respect, and it's doing wonders for morale in the face of the degradation of our professional experience and expertise by the board and segments of the community. So thank you to all of you who have come to our aid. We love all of our students and our jobs and being treated as public servants instead of public enemies 15 seconds. is critical to our ability to continue to serve our young learners. It feels symbiotic to spend our days looking after and nurturing our, your, their kids and then to have them spend their valuable time doing the same for us. It's these acts of kindness that will encourage many of us. Thank you, Ms. Wolf, Casey Nice, Stephanie Chancy, followed by Patricia Roberts. Ms. Nice, are you online? She is online. We're asking to unmute. I am. Can you unhear? Can you hear me? We can. Go ahead. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, the Gems School stories have been super passionate. Um, so I definitely feel for, feel for you. Please keep those school open and hear their pleas. Uh, Mr. Peterson, the fact that you repeatedly try to use the statement that someone did it before me, so it's okay, is crazy. Spending taxpayer dollars to have a new attorney prove your point is even worse. There's a pun about jumping off a bridge because your friends have done so. Doesn't make it right that my mother told me as a young child. And it's crazy to hear that you use this argument as a grown adult. This is not appropriate to make a comment like this in front of our children. And I'm appalled as a leader, you'd make these comments and continue this legal battle. You are on the board of education, the president, what you are saying to our children, they are listening to. And I hope that our children don't think it's okay to do something illegal just because someone else has done it. And I don't think that anyone else has done it. There have been allegations made tonight that a lot of people have said, and yet there has been no lawsuit that has been brought and no judgment that has been made against any one else other than the four majority board members. Congratulations, Kaylee. While I commend you for following through on your commitment, we're meant to sleep after seconds. not work. I ask that we table this decision. 
it's crazy as a community that we're not allowing her to spend time with our family. How is this putting our children and our community first when the board member that stood for this? Thank you, Ms. Nice, Stephanie Chancy, Patricia Roberts, followed by Lily Porter. Ms. Chancy online. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you to David Ray, Susan Meek, Elizabeth Hansen, and Elizabeth Hansen for your experience, knowledge, and expertise. There are thousands of us who are extremely grateful for your commitment to holding the board majority accountable. It is absolutely sickening to see the board majority completely disregard the veteran school board members. The board is supposed to work together, and Peterson, Weiniger, Myers, and Williams have shown nothing but unprofessionalism. Many of us question your capability to make decisions for 64,000 students. You have literally changed people's lives based on your destructive and unethical behavior. It is absurd that we have to fight so hard for public education. None of the meetings so far have actually focused on education. They're focused on the lies, deceit, and illegal activity that our board majority has brought to our school district. These illegal activities not only cost our district thousands of dollars, the board majority also wants to fight the injunction that given to them by the judge will take more money from our schools. What is your end goal? To make take more money away from public schools? You said in your campaign video, video that you want to bring back boring to the board meetings. It is far from boring. I am humiliated for all four of you. The whole country is watching your embarrassing behavior. So far, I have not witnessed any of your actions that put kids first. It is obvious that you don't want our neighborhood schools to succeed. 15 seconds. So far are set up for the neighborhood schools to fail and for our teachers to leave the district. I do not believe that you want the bond and mill to pass. Sure, you will put the ballot on the ballot, but who in their right mind will trust you with our tax dollars, given all the wasteful spending that you have done? Next by Patricia Roberts, Lily Porter, followed by Stephanie Mayer. Uh, Patricia Roberts, are you online? She is not online, sir. Okay, we will move to Stephanie Maher, followed by Marion Ulmer, followed by Allison Gr uh, Grime. Is Ms. Maher online? Yes, I'm here. Go ahead. I am reading the following comment for a teacher. Hello, directors. I am a teacher of over 25 years in the district. The first decade was golden. Our district was always number one and everyone wanted to teach here. We made the news for positive things and achievements. And here we are today. Our district is all over the news for anything but positive things. We have four directors who have broken the law. It's all over the news. The same directors want to appeal a judge's decision that says, just follow the law. Again, it's all over the news. Aaron Kane, all over the news for anything but positive things. She got caught sneaking around with the four board members who broke the law. She has various laws that still active against her from American Academy and she has never even had a teacher's or an administrator's license. I am tired of all the sad publicity that has come to my district since November. You know, the only one who has only positive press, Danny Winter. You can't find anything negative about him anywhere. Only masses of support and respect from staff and community members. I suggest the four of you watch the video that was on the news from Danny Wynn, Administrator of the Year. That's positive. It is infuriating that the unqualified majority directors have destroyed our district's reputation and have already destroyed 15 seconds. a completely unqualified person to be superintendent. We are highly educated people and we can see your agenda being played out. And sadly, it most definitely does not put kids first. It puts them last. For these four, it's politics first. We have Marianne Ulmer, Allison Grime, followed by Brianna Betts. It's Miss Ulmer online. I am. Go ahead, thank you. Hi, good evening school board members. I am speaking tonight to show my support for Aaron Kane. I have been listening to both candidates and what they will be doing for my child and the community. It is clear to me, Aaron Kane is the right person to lead us into the next phase of growth for our school district. She is obviously capable and willing to work with all affected parties to address any and all concerns that we have as parents whether that be budgeting or managing the school district or some politicized issue we keep going around and around about. I feel Eric Aaron Kane will be the most effective leader for Douglas County School District. Thank you. Thank you. We have Allison Grime, followed by Brianna Betts, followed by Walter Bennett. It's Ms. Grime online. Yes, I am. Go ahead. 
now that it is public knowledge that litigation insurance will not be covered will not be covering further court costs, I cannot believe the board would choose to pursue appeal of an order that just requires them to follow the law at my expense. What motivation do I have to vote for an MLO if this is where my tax dollars are going? The board can argue that the district needs money to fund a much needed pay increase for teachers and staff, but actions speak louder than words and your actions show that you're willing to spend my money inappropriately. I was not a parent in this district when Erin King was interim superintendent, but it appears she has many conflicts of interest in being offered the superintendent position, which we all assume is what you'll be doing tonight. It is clear that Kane and the board majority planned even prior to swearing in to oust Corey Wise and replace him with Kane. Beyond this concern, I listened to their interviews. Kane spoke to the board and how she would support you and your needs and interests, but I felt like Danny Windsor was speaking to me as a parent. I felt like he saw that his responsibility to the district lies with the kids and the parents and the teachers. He has plans to grow and expand and improve. Each of you as well as well as your top pick for superintendent has said many times that the divide in this district could be mended by just listening to each other. Not once since you guys took over have I felt listened to as a DCSD parent. I have not felt represented. You cannot make progress on this board as long as you continue seconds. to ignore a large portion of your constituents. It's time to listen to everyone and show that you can be trustworthy and responsible with district dollars. Thank you for your time. Thank you. We will have Brianna Betts. Walter Bennett, followed by Rebecca Weiniger. Ms. Betts, are you online? Yes. Go ahead. I'm a mother of three kids in our Douglas County Public Schools and also a teacher at one of our Douglas County Public High Schools. I'm here to represent the 150 or more students that I teach every year. It's no secret that our school system operates on an extremely tight budget. I wanna illustrate for you what it looks like in my classroom. First, it looks like textbooks that are older than my students. The biology textbooks I have in my classroom were written in 2002. The anatomy and physiology textbooks were written in 1998. While foundational information may still be valid, I assure you that technology and scientific advancements have greatly improved throughout the past 24 years. I have been told to reduce the number of copies I make in an effort to reduce costs. Therefore, I rely on technology more often. Well, I have 10 Chromebooks for classes of up to 32 students to share. Upwards of 80% of my anatomy and physiology students have requested the addition of a second level of anatomy classes to help them prepare for medical studies and careers after high school. Their requests have been denied due to budget concerns. This is what the budget looks like in my classroom before any of the frivolous spending that this board is proposing to spend fighting their own personal legal fees. Four of the board members ran on the slogan, kids first. I urge you to put these kids first by voting against the use of our district seconds. funds to fight your personal legal battles. Our kids deserve the best resources to support their learning and leaders who actually consider how their actions affect the students in our schools. These kids deserve more than just a catchy slogan. Thank you for your time. Thank you. We'll have Walter Bennett, followed by Rebecca Weiniger, followed by Serenity Hayes. Mr. Bennett, are you online? I am. Can you hear me? Go ahead. I'm speaking for a district employee and parent. I've been closely watching the board meetings lately, and I'm increasingly concerned with the division in our district. I'd like to move forward with a student-centered focus in our school district, as I'm sure most of us would. I would like to speak directly to the four new board members. I'd like to remind you that you ran on a Kids First campaign kids first. To me, that means putting the needs of our students above all else. I'd like to know how appealing this current lawsuit and denying any culpability in the actions you've taken move this district in a positive direction and puts our kids first. You're not setting the example to bridge the division in our district and are wasting funds and resources that should be for our students. Please show our students, staff, and families that you really do want to put kids first. Do what the judges ask. State publicly that you'll follow the Colorado Open Meetings Law from this point forward, and you'll be more transparent and public with your actions on this board. Stop this appeal process that will take greatly needed funds from our school district. Be an example to our community. This is a simple lesson I try to show my own children. Accept and recognize when you've done something wrong and move forward in a positive manner. Please show our children that we as adults must also follow the rules and admit when we are wrong. We all make mistakes and that's okay. We learn from our mistakes. 15 now, seconds. admit that you made a mistake and let's move forward and truly put our kids first. Thank you. Rebecca Weiniger, Serenity Hayes, followed by Jessica Metzler. Ms. Weiniger, are you online? She is online and unmuted. Ms. Weiniger, can you hear us? 
in. Can you hear me? Yep, go ahead. Okay. Thanks for the time. I have two elementary age children and serve on our neighborhood school PTO board. I'm joining the conversation to voice my support for Danny Windsor. Simply put, he is the less divisive choice. I have been sad and disappointed as I've watched some of the recent decisions by our board, decisions that in my opinion do not put our kids or taxpayers first. The decision to terminate a superintendent and pay out his contract creating chaos and division when we could have tried to work together and if needed, make a change when his contract was up. Discussions tonight that will evaluate legal fees and lawsuits that cost our district valuable funds. I'm all too familiar with how hard parents work raising funds for our school where the district falls short of covering needed expenses. To me, the, to me, actions speak louder than words. If you want to pass an MLO, you need to prove you will not recklessly appropriate funds. People don't want to pay for lawsuits and terminated contracts. They want to pay to support kids. We should be focused on ensuring we have resources in the right place to support the kids. There are many who expect hiring Aaron Kane was the choice all along, why Corey was fired, which is fueling more anger and seconds. more division. Please prove people wrong and lean into Danny's experience and tenure supporting Douglas County schools. Actions speak louder than words. Choose the less divisive candidate. Build trust. Let's focus on passing an MLO. We will now have Serenity Hayes, Jessica Metzler, followed by Tiffany Wilson. Ms. Hayes, you're online. I am, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. First, congratulations, Director Weiniger. Thank you for your dedication. Second, I support Erin Kane for our new superintendent. She has a proven track record with American Academy and superintendent experience in our district. Under the previous board, our public school students struggled with their grades, social connection, and depression because of masking, remote learning, and hybrid schedules. All while Erin Kane kept her students in person, full time, while still giving families the choice of remote learning if needed. The low turnover rate for her teachers and long wait lists of families hoping they'll get the opportunity to go to her school says it all. Third, directors, if you do not get your first choice for the new superintendent, please keep in mind the community. Your students and teachers are watching. Model for them what it looks like to lose with grace. Consider your words your Facebook posts, and what you say to those that may need reassurance that the sky is not falling. Please choose to use your actions and words to calm the disruptors, not add fuel to the fire. The minority board members and their supporters continue to be at war against the new board members. Meet Gray and Hansen. Show us that your commitment to our kids' education is seconds. greater than your desire for power or step aside. Lastly, my heart goes out to the GEM families. Let's figure out what we need to do for them. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now have Jessica Metzler, Tiffany Wilson, followed by Tracy Jones. Ms. Metzler, are you online? Yes. Can you hear me? We can. Go ahead. Uh, I'm reading a statement for a Douglas County teacher. I would like to know how the board is putting kids first. Paying exorbitant amounts of taxpayer money for court cases is not putting kids first. Hiring expensive lawyers to protect only certain members of the board is not putting kids first. Breaking the spirit of the sunshine law is not putting kids first. Negotiating backroom deals to get rid of an amazing superintendent is not putting kids first. Saying you only want to work with people who voted for you is not putting kids first. Being a former teacher who taught through the Fagan years but then switching sides to actively work against teachers' best interest is not putting kids first. Choosing a superintendent without a teaching degree or experience or public administration experience for, the, for that matter, just because that individual donated to your campaign would not be putting kids first. What would be put, put kids first is this board working together for the benefit of the students. While I understand the work is hard and that we would all like to go home, it would be in the best interest of the community for all board members to follow the laws put in place to make sure public business is done in a public forum. Hiring da Danny Windsor as superintendent would go a long way in actively showing the community that you want to put kids first instead of the political cavern cavern into seconds. which you have seconds. dug yourselves. Thank you. Tiffany Wilson, Tracy Jones, followed by Cindy Thompson. Ms. Wilson, are you online? Yes, good evening. Can you hear me? We can, go ahead. 
Okay, thank you. I am calling to support selecting Aaron Kane as the new Douglas County Superintendent. This county, our schools need change. We need someone who will take charge, someone who will be an advocate, not only to teachers and staff, but for our children. We need a leader who will fix what's broken in the public schools. This county does not need someone who has affiliation with school unions or other special interests. We are at a crossroads. Do we pull and move our kids to charter or do we stay in public schools? I will do what's necessary to ensure my children not left behind or passed through because of the lowering of standards and the excuse of COVID for two years. Directors Ray, Meek, and Hansen, you have been throwing stones in a glass house, pointing fingers with fingers being pointed back. I would be careful when you speak of transparency. The prior board showed zero transparency with Dr. Tucker's resignation, zero transparency on the two-in-one meetings and the three-in-one meetings that were held with Mr. Wise and individuals associated with the union. Does this mean the litigation gets three additional names added or does it get dropped? You continue to put your politics before our kids. Those who continue to show support for you are the same individuals who are bullying our kids, attacking anyone who thinks differently, and yet they are screaming for equity. You three continue to hide behind them and let them do your dirty work. 15 if seconds. You do not publicly, if you do not publicly speak out against the bullying of our kids and community and the chaos that your supporters are causing, I'm asking for your resignation. Kaylee, you are a rock star. Thank you. Tracy Jones, Cindy Thompson, followed by Calissa Braga. Ms. Jones, are you online? I, uh, yeah, I already spoke. I think there was an issue, like the technical stuff, but yeah. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> um, we will move on, I guess, then to Cindy Thompson. Ms. Thompson, are you online? I am. Can you hear me? We can hear you now. Go ahead. Great. I am speaking on behalf of a teacher in Douglas County. I have proudly been a teacher in Douglas County for 21 years. My number one priority is always what's best for my students. The school I teach at is a one-to-one, -one, which means each student must bring their own computer device to class. Some kids don't have the means for this, so our school has a small bank of computers. Kids can check in and check out on a daily basis. Sadly, if a student doesn't get to school early enough, the devices run out, the student goes without a computer all day. Because our math, science, and our social studies curriculum are all computer-based, those students do not get the opportunity to complete the practices and assignments in class like their peers do. Why am I bringing this up? I read the cost of four new board members appealing the judge's order could run our district 90,000. I can't even imagine how many extra computers for our students that would buy. If we just had one, just one extra computer in each class, students would never get behind in work. 90,000 could be spent on so many other things and appeal a decision that, do that does not even have any penalties for you. The judge did not sentence you to any time, money, or any other penalty. The judge just said, follow the law. And you want to appeal that, why? For your own ego? I thought you ran on kids first. Can you, can you name one single thing you've done that's made education better for 15 our district? seconds. Can you name one single teacher, not a charter, that you've sat down with and asked what's needed in the classrooms? Have you done anything, anything at all for our students besides creating havoc and chaos? Quit spending our students' money on you. Calissa Braga, Chad Cox, followed by Jane Batt. Ms. Braga, are you online? She is not online, sir. Chad Cox, are you online? I'm online. Okay, we can hear you, go ahead. I'm speaking to you tonight on an effort to have you pause moving forward with appealing the ruling in the matter of Marshall versus Board of Education et al. I recently had the pleasure of sitting down with my children's school administrators, some faculty and a group of fellow parents to discuss how to allocate the 2022-23 discretionary and non-discretionary budget. While we were able to keep all faculty in place, we did have to stretch a few members thin thinner than what anyone would be comfortable with. While we have the privilege of living and attending schools in one of the more affluent districts, this does not mean we have a pot of excess funds from which to flush down the drain. You have already clogged the toilet with nearly a quarter mil in money that would have been better spent keeping the superintendent that we had. Now being found in violation of Colorado's open meeting law and issued an injunction simply stating that you must follow the law. What a noble idea, huh? You want to break out the plunger in an effort to force more brown stuff down the throats of taxpayers to appeal the ruling and argue that, quote, you have done nothing different than, borders, than boards before you have done. That's not a defense, and it's, it's an excuse of a five-year-old. 
So I guess I'm a parent and asking five-year-olds in the room to grow up, accept the little slap on the hand you received, take a time out and think about what you've done, learn from the consequences and quit wasting hundreds of thousands of dollars that will come directly out of our children's funds as your insurance has stated it will not cover the cost. I am not a fortune teller, but I do see a civil suit for each one of you in your future if you continue forward with an appeal in order to pay back our children. Thank you, Mr. Cox. Jane Batt will be the last speaker of the night. Is Miss Batt online? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? Go ahead. My name is Jane Bott. I am a parent and a teacher here in Douglas County. The many events leading up to today have made me fearful and emotionally drained. So today I felt it absolutely necessary to speak to you, the board, so you can hear the thoughts and stress and fears from teachers as you make your decision tonight. I will speak to you on items I hope you directors truly considered prior to making your final decision on our superintendent. Experience working with different pockets of our community and communities outside of Douglas County truly matter. This experience creates a well-rounded leader. However, I want to highlight the experience within the education field. Experience directly from coaching, leading through being a principal, guiding through counseling, and especially being face-to-face -face with students and teachers because this gives our leader the ability to see and make changes thoughtfully. Experiencing how teachers lead from inside a classroom and being an ally to a teacher by showing up every day in your school is exponentially different and more challenging than just obtaining a degree. One will never understand the pressures, challenges, the chaos and joys of teaching unless they themselves are in it with the teachers in the building day in and day out. Because of this, Danny Windsor understands what education looks like seconds. and feels like on both great days and hard days. Our district already has over 500 job openings and it's still growing. It is clear we need a leader who will bridge our community and that is Danny Windsor. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bott. <laughs> Moving on to item number eight, adoption of the consent agenda. The recommendation is to approve the consent agenda as presented and that includes items number nine through number 15. Uh, Director Peterson, I'd like to remove number nine. Okay, we have a request to remove number nine, approval of personnel changes. And to discuss it as an individual action item. And I, go ahead, I will go ahead and make a motion that we adopt the consent agenda for items 10 through 15. Second. 10 to 15, motion by Ray, second by Hansen. If there are no other motions, I'll call the roll to adopt consent agenda items number 10 through 15 and move number nine to study action items. Uh, Director Hansen. Aye. Meek. Aye. Myers. Aye. Peterson. Aye. Ray. Aye. Williams. Aye. Weiniger. Aye. <laughs> Passed seven to zero, and I will make a note to move number nine. Moving on to number 16, approval of minutes, and this would be approval of the Board of Education minutes as presented for February 4th, 8th, 16th, 22nd, and for March 1st. Do I have a motion for approval of minutes as presented? Motion to approve the minutes as presented. Motion by Ray. Second. Second by Myers. Director Hansen. Aye. Meek. Aye. Myers. Aye. Peterson, aye. Ray, aye. <clears throat> Williams, aye. Weininger, aye. Pass seven to zero as presented. Moving to item number uh, or the study action items, we will first take up number nine, the personnel changes as presented um, as part of the consent agenda. Any discussion around the personnel changes? Yeah, Director Peterson, I pulled that item. So I, just a quick clarification. When this was originally published, uh, it had Corey Wise's name on the personnel changes. And then uh, later, a new revised edition had that removed. I just thought for the sake of transparency to our community, as well as helping me understand what the change was, if we could explain that. 
Sure. Uh, Ms. Thompson, do you have any comments on that, that change? I do see that there is the corrected uh, personnel list attached. Yeah, there's two, two lists. And right. one, one was already public, publicly posted, so that would be helpful to understand the change. Yes, thank you. Um, in previous conversations, um, it had been shared that the board had previously already acted upon that personnel change for Mr. Wise and that it did not need to be re-posted through. So that, yeah. So acted meaning that we have submitted our resolution to terminate his contract. Is that... Yes. What you mean by acting on? Yes. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. No further questions. If there are no further questions, do we have a motion to to approve the personnel changes as presented? So moved. Moved by Myers. Second. Seconded by Meek. I'll now call the roll. Director Hansen. Aye. Director Meek. Aye. Director Myers? Aye. Director Peterson? Aye. Director Ray? Aye. Director Williams? Aye. Director Weiniger? Aye. Item number nine, personnel changes passed seven to zero. We will now move on to study action item number 17, review and consideration of uh, board file policy BEAA electronic participation in school board meetings. The current policy was attached as a attachment. Um, we'll take any discussion and then any motions. Um, I'll go ahead and just start off on the discussion. I don't know if we need to act on this tonight, but I thought I would bring it up as I believe there is some lack of clarity in our current attendance, uh, specifically the, the issues I have before opening it up to other directors is it makes no delineation as to what personal circumstances may be. I think we may be able to uh, add some language around what, uh, quote, personal circumstances may require members to be absent from a meeting. And the second issue that I think we should take up, again, we can do it tonight or in a future meeting uh, after consideration, is the differentiation between regularly scheduled board meetings and special meetings. Um, as we know, special meetings may come up on a short notice. and. According to our current policy, it just says a board member may attend and participate by electronic means in a maximum of two board meetings per calendar year. We already have, uh, due to inclement weather and other things, and if you include all special meetings, directors that are basically at that threshold or, in fact, have exceeded that threshold if we were to encounter inclement weather. So those are the only two things I think we should clarify in my recommendation would be to differentiate um, the difference between special meetings and not have those count due to the short notice and keep the current maximum at two regularly scheduled board meetings per calendar year. Again, that's just my thoughts. We can have a discussion. We do not have to take up changes tonight, or we can if people have amendments to propose. I'll open it up to any other directors. Well, with regards to the, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Director. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, go ahead, Director Ray first, then Director Williams. Uh, no, dir oh, sorry. So, so in regards to the uh, extenuating circumstances, uh, Director Peterson, I think it does define it as uh, a member's job, military service, or personal circumstances. So I don't know. Are there? Is there some vagueness in those three that you're concerned about? It, it was the personal circumstances. I thought we could explain that maybe to consider that personal circumstances may include travel to from the meeting location during forecast significant weather or any other safety related issues. Just to say, if a director thought that they had a safety issue in their ability to physically arrive at a meeting, that we should, of course, allow them uh, to attend electronically. And it, and it really wasn't the extenuating circumstances. It was the quote personal circumstances. And I wanted to make sure that safety was broken out there, that each director could make their own assessment. Sure. And Any I would just say personal to me means the same as you're describing. So <laughs> right. I, I, I'm indifferent to whether that needs to be revised or not. But okay. it always seems if we start delineating more reasons that we always come back to, well, we need to make another exception because this doesn't capture it. So um, I'm indifferent. If, if you feel strongly about it, I, I certainly won't object. And I guess the other comment I would make, um, I, I agree with you. I think 
the two board meetings per calendar year should have referred to regular board meetings and not special meetings. At one time, we did have a separate policy for special meetings, which um, did state that those could be attended telephonically, I think was the term it was used back then. Um, but I, I would have no problem with um, the regular, delineating that it's the two regularly scheduled board meetings, so. And I agree, I think um, we certainly don't want to have anyone try to attend a meeting when um, it's um, not safe or they have personal issues that would require them not to be here. So I have no problem making those revisions uh, tonight if, if necessary, so. Director Meek, go ahead. Yeah, I, I don't think I have problems. I like separating them because we're having so many special meetings that it's a little crazy. So my only desire is that we make suggestions and then vote at a future meeting so the public has an opportunity to weigh in. Yeah, I'll, I will certainly take that on. Again, we don't need to act tonight, but I wanted to at least have the discussion tonight about the concerns. And if directors um, have other concerns, just I would be prepared to discuss this at a future meeting and make motions and actually vote that uh, on. I don't think we have any concerns right now about the meeting of uh, about the electronic attendance at this point, as long as we uh, kind of tacitly agree that we can continue to uh, have people attend electronically as long as they're not missing regular meetings until we get this policy updated. And I think that's a generally agreed to. I'm seeing a lot of head shakes on this board because I don't want people to come forward and say, by the letter of the law, we have people that have already missed two meetings if we count all the special meetings and, and then have an issue. So, Director Williams. Yeah, so I'm actually in favor of tabling this issue until um, we have a lot on our plate tonight. So mm -hmm. I, I don't think this is... Um, a big priority, but I am definitely in favor of making sure we separate both regular and special meetings. Okay, and if there's no discussion and no motions, which seems to be the case, we can move forward to the next item on the agenda. Okay, uh, next item on the agenda is item number 18, offer of employment to a sole finalist for Douglas County School District RE1 Superintendent of Schools. And the recommendation is that the Board of Election modify and adopt the resolution to offer employment to a sole finalist uh, for the Douglas County School District Superintendent of Schools. President Peterson. Um, Go ahead, Director um, we Myers. Can, I, I move to nominate Aaron Kane for the Douglas County School District Superintendent of Schools. I understand you have a motion to modify the resolution to insert the name of Aaron Kane as the sole finalist? Yes. Okay. Is there a second? Second. Motion by Myers, second by Williams. I would make a secondary motion that we insert the name Danny Windsor into our resolution for moving forward as sole finalist. We have a second motion uh, to insert the name for sole finalist, to modify the resolution to send, insert the name of sole finalist of Danny Windsor, and that is by uh, Director Ray. Do we have a second? Second. We have a second by Hansen. We would take the second matter up first, but first we can have any discussion or questions as required um, by the individual directors. President Peterson. Go ahead, Director Myers. You know, I, as the board secretary, I looked over all the plus and deltas of the panels, the surveys, community forums, and the emails, and I feel very confident that the school board had has very high, two highly qualified candidates for superintendent and two leaders that I think can get this district united back on tracks. We can support teachers, listen to students, they're positive, they're goal-oriented, both of them, and they support the needs of all students. These qualities are reiterated, I think, across the board by all great panels. And I've answered several hundred emails in support of the two candidates, and our community, I believe, just wants to move forward. Now, I personally believe that the 
superintendent is essentially the CEO of district and the district management experience is essential. Now a CEO has surrounds themselves with experts and a CEO is not necessarily an expert in every field, but they know where to find and how to put their place in the administration. So I believe the two qualities that Erin Kane has set, set her apart as the best candidate, number one, she's done the job before. She's strong, she has a proven track record and having done this position before, she knows what it will take to do this job and during her time as interim superintendent, Erin visited every school. She has many great ideas. I know that she will carry through her idea. For example, she mentioned a CTE, CTE program for teachers in helping to serve the long-term teacher shortage and she will connect regularly with teachers and staff when she suggested that she would have an open Zoom meeting every two weeks where teachers can ask questions and the number two is her courage. And I think that that comes from the deepest recesses of our soul, where there's belief, hope, conviction, and a grounded optimism tempered by life experiences. You either have courage or you do not have courage. And when you have courage, you do not default to fear. So fear creates weak leaders. Weak leaders expect less of others. When we have a fear, it leads to demoralization, independence, loss of choices, abdication of personal responsibility, and progressive darkness. Fear extinguishes our co commitment to timeless. Erin Kane, during COVID, had the exact opposite of fear. She had the confidence to make moral cho choices, which, she's, which is where she is grounded. She doesn't sh shift to the current trend, the progressive mo movement, and she cannot be bullied. She had the courage to give choice to the parents of the students, and she provided in-school learning and remote learning when making a hard choice. So I believe Erin Kane will fight for what is right. Abraham Lincoln once said, courage is not the absence of fear. It is going forward with the face of fear. And that's why I believe Aaron Kane is the best choice for the superintendent of the Douglas County School District. Thank you, Director Myers. Any other directors? Director Ray. Well, I think we're talking about Danny Windsor. Yes, I <laughs> know that, but I wanted I to, to get my, I know. I wanted to get second, my. Second motion first. So the second, <laughs> just to be clear, the, the, I, the initial motion was for Aaron Kane. We had a second motion, which we are addressing now right. uh, for Danny Windsor. I'll, we'll take that out of your time for the first motion, <laughs> Director Myers. Thank you. Uh, so any other directors on the second motion, which is the modification of the resolution to insert the name Dan Danny Windsor? D Director Ray, go ahead. So I, I concur, uh, first of all, with Director Myers regarding we have two very capable finalists um, for the position. And, and I always, I, and it, well, I'll save my comments um, because I, obviously I've been quoted many times um, regarding our uh, support or my support of Erin Kane. Um, certainly, and she did a fine job. I, I certainly will not uh, waver from that position while she was the interim superintendent. Um, however, I believe that when we really look at the data objectively, uh, let's begin with um, the, the community survey or the community forum surveys. We received about 1,300 responses. Um, read through every one of those um, yesterday morning through today, and certainly what you see if you if you look at those objectively and ask the question, how many of those are favorable, have favorable impressions for Danny Windsor, and how many are favorable impressions of Aaron, you get kind of a different perspective in terms of just quantifying it. Um, certainly what my calculations came up with is that there was, of the 1,300, there was about 22% that had favorable responses about Aaron. There was 97% that had favorable responses regarding Danny. Our first round of interviews that we did publicly as a board, we also had a session of collecting input for those interviews as well. Um, and again, just to quantify those, uh, we had 596 people respond um, regarding Aaron. 
where there was 43, 433 that were favorable impressions, which is about 72% of the people that responded. Um, for Danny, we had 748 responses, uh, 736 were favorable with, again, roughly 98% of those respondents were favorable. I think if you go back, and I, know, I don't know if all of us had the opportunity, I know I had the opportunity to, to talk to the facilitators of each of the interview panels. And that was very insightful um, as well. And, and I think, again, what some of the themes I find with regards to Danny, um, the very first thing that the facilitator said about the license and the classified employees panel was they would follow him anywhere. And that really resonated for me in terms of he already has tremendous support of the organization of the system already. Uh, they liked that he has a wide network and connections with diverse stakeholders. Uh, they, they said that he showed his love for the district uh, by using a lot of we statements um, as opposed to I statements. And I know as a um, hiring professional for many years, that was something we always listened for too is does, do candidates project themselves as just I, or do they see themselves as part of the organization or part of the team? I also like this uh, statement that the classified and licensed employees made. They said he listens to understand, he doesn't listen to respond, and how different that is. But I think if you listen to our facilitators all through each of the panels, you really heard a different kind of passion about Danny in terms of his heart, in, in terms of how he speaks to the whole child, in terms of his servant leadership. Um, even the students was really what I always enjoy the most and listen for. Um, but they, um, some of the things they described him as is that they, they said he respected us, and they could tell he valued diversity. Um, you could tell that he loves the district, and they used several words, and, and just, like I said, I love our kids, because they, to me, are the most insightful of this organization, but they, these are the words they used. Thoughtful, reflective, authentic, listener, inclusive, goal-oriented, experienced, knowledgeable, uh, advocate for our mental health, and so those are the, out of the words of, of our students. Um, and to me, that has the heaviest bearing in terms of where I think we need to go with a superintendent. Um, for me, the question really becomes, um, who can provide the calm and the stability that we desperately need in this organization? Um, we, we desperately want that stability and calmness for our staff and our students, our teachers. Um, and so as I listen to both candidates and I listen to how they're responded to, and I think we even heard that from some of our public commenters tonight, someone said, who is the candidate that's going to cause the least amount of continued turmoil and, and continued polarization. And this is not all, and this is not at all a diss towards Erin, but it, she just comes with a different set of uh, things that people perceive, whether it's wrong or right. But I don't hear that in Danny. I mean, even when you listen to the public commenters tonight, I didn't hear anyone talk about the polarization that Danny represents. Um, they talked about the fact that they see him as someone that supports teachers and staff. You know, one of the things that I know back when we did our screening interviews, I think there was this moment that all seven of us had where we had this glimmer of hope. Because we walked out of the screening interviews with two people that we really felt like could lead us and, and provide us that continuity and, and collaboration and coming together. Um, and I, that was a good moment to feel that, to feel that we honestly could find someone that could cause all of us to be on the same page as far as returning our focus to kids as opposed to it. And this is a quote that Danny said in his interview. He said he wants to take the focus off of the seven people on the dais and put it back on our students. And that resonated uh, with me as well. So I, I just think we have such an opportunity tonight to do something pretty incredible 
um, and send a message to our community that we can come together, um, that we can rally behind a leader, but more importantly, we can, we can rally behind the symbolism that says that this is a person that we believe can pull us all together and help, it's like some, one of the speakers said, take it down a notch, take the temperature down. Um, I, I just feel that if we put Danny forward as our sole finalist, we will immediately hear this sense of relief from a multiple a multitude of people. Uh, and it's not because Erin is not an exceptional leader, she is, but there are so many unfortunate circumstances surrounding her candidacy that we we continue to hear tonight, we continue to hear in our email, you know, and whether it's true or not, I'm not, you know, I'm not gonna press that tonight, um, but it's just unfortunate uh, the path that Erin has been on, not because of her, but just because of the circumstances around um, some issues around board majority versus board minority. So I would just appeal to all of you uh, to do what's in the best interest of our district, not just the supporters who elected us, but what will get us back on track to focus on student learning rather than reacting to this frenziness of divisiveness. Um, so I would tell you my vote tonight for Danny is more symbolic uh, than it is for one individual. Uh, selecting Danny to me symbolizes and signals a desire to find common ground, to restore trust, and to place the students or place the replace the focus on our students and not us. Um, so that's what I would advocate is that let's do something symbolic tonight. The greatest gift we could give our community our staff, our students, is to walk away tonight with a 7-0 decision on a sole finalist. And I think if we could do that, that would be a huge turning point for us as a board, but even more importantly, for the district in terms of moving forward. So those are just some beginning thoughts I have regarding moving Mr. Windsor forward as a sole finalist. Other directors on the motion to uh, amend the resolution and add Danny Windsor as the sole finalist. Director Meek. I don't think I have as much to say, but I agree with everything uh, mm -hmm. Director Ray said. I think as I'm thinking about it, I'm thinking who can build a bridge the best for us right now and with our community. And, and I'm thinking about listening to all of the gym center parents today and you could just feel what it means to have safety, feeling included, feeling a sense of belonging. And when I listen to Mr. Windsor speak about safety and answer that question, he expanded his answer to include information on mental health and safety and inclusion. And that resonated with me when I was listening to him because we have heard over and over the importance of mental health. Um, and so that just resonated with me. And Mr. Windsor also expanding on CTE programming and, and all of those opportunities for students, for post-secondary, his relationships with the community. We have the new, I'm not even sure what we're calling, the Innovation Center, um, Legacy Campus, um, and, his ties to programming and, and business interests and everything. So that just seems like a really natural fit, looking at what we need right now. And so those have resonated with me. Um, and then who will help us build trust the most? Um, trust among us, the board, and then trust among the community. And you know, I heard loud and clear that there was a lack of trust with the prior superintendent. And I ask each of you to think about all of us up here on the board when there are meetings that have been held with one of those candidates in a private retreat, that there's pre-existing relationships there. When you contacted that candidate, you know, before there was even a job opening, um, financial contributions to campaigns. I mean, people question conflict of interest. And so, those are issues that are out there that the community knows about, but they're also 
things that we as a board need to work on with with building trust with whoever we put into that position. And I feel like Mr. Windsor is someone we could put into that position and be able to move forward most quickly and build the relationships that we need to build most quickly. Um, I could probably go on and on and I know it's, it's late, but those were just some of the main points that are resonating with me and contemplating Mr. Windsor. Other directors and Director Weininger, if you want to speak up, just either interrupt or just put your camera on if you're even able. So um, any other directors for the second motion on Danny Windsor? Director Hanson, go ahead. Yeah, I agree with the comments that have already been made. I just um, think there's one critical um, piece of this that just needs to be emphasized, and that's our teacher voice. Um, there are always going to be, I don't know, we can say a thousand people over here and a thousand people over here, and no matter what we say or do, <laughs> um, those people are going to struggle to find the middle. There are tens of thousands of people in this middle, and they couldn't even tell you our names but they could tell you the names of their teachers and those teachers and those principals and those EAs and our employees who work with their children every single day. And those voices are the voices that I think deserve the greatest weight in our system because that is how we ultimately provide our kids an outstanding education is through the individuals that work with them every single day. And the voice that has come from our teachers and our staff has been loud and clear that Danny Windsor is their choice. And um, I feel like we have an obligation to hear, not just, not just say we hear you, but to actually use our votes our actions to say we hear you and we support you. Thank you, Director Hanson. Any other directors? Director Williams? So I, I echo the fact that we have two outstanding candidates and I also felt that glimmer of hope when we left uh, executive session that day after interviewing and uh, knowing that we had two really great candidates. And things that I've seen of Danny just in my short time on the board, he, he is extremely genuine. He has a ginormous heart for our kids. Um, we obviously had, you know, teachers uh, reach out in support. And, uh, you know, I, I think he is extremely thorough, like just looking at what he, you know, did with a, with a legacy campus and those sorts of things. So where I put my vote is not about me me thinking that there's anything necessarily wrong with Danny. And while I understand um, saying that putting all seven of us will help bridge the gap and, and trust, I also feel like I have a responsibility with my vote as one person to put the vote on, on, on the person that I feel in the end can do the things that are, especially in the short term, considering MLO and bond. And that's um, and that's where I am. Any other directors on the second motion for Danny Windsor? I'll go ahead and speak for, oh, go ahead, I'm sorry, uh, Kaylee, uh, Director Weiniger. No, it's okay, I'm trying to juggle a couple things. Um, yeah, I agree <laughs> a lot with what people said. Um, we're so lucky that we can't go wrong with either choice. Um, and I agree that what I liked a lot about Danny is, um, I think it was in one of the cabinet's feedbacks was he'll focus on students and not the board of education. Cause that's, even though the superintendent reports to us, like they need to be the person who's the hands and feet of putting our students first. So I really like that about Danny. Um, with Aaron, I thought our last, meeting with public comment had so many heartfelt commenters about her. It wasn't just pointing daggers at Danny. It was about talking about how great Aaron is. And one of them even made my pregnant hormones cry about how they disagree on a lot of things, but she's the right choice for our kids. And um, I think they both have heart. So something I wrote that they both have was they both love this district they both understand this district's needs. They both have a heart for kids. 
Um, and they're both very, very likable with positive attitudes. Um, however, for me, one was, was more confident, courageous, and not afraid to challenge the narrative, had more clear and direct answers, um, was more actionable, and had more experience with executive leadership skills. So that's kind of where I um, put value on my decisions. And I read all the panels and all the um, forums and took that to heart too as well. But um, I think when it comes to my vote, um, while we can't go wrong with Danny, I, I really uh, will be voting for Aaron. Thank you, Director Weininger. Any other directors for the second motion around Danny Windsor? I'll make my quick comments then, which is uh, I also thought, think we have two excellent candidates. And one of the first things I said coming out of the, the selection of two finalists is I'm sleeping better knowing that uh, the district's going to be in good hands regardless. Um, I agree. I think Danny is going to be a person who continues to be a great voice for the teachers, and I think that's one of his strengths, and I would trust both of these finalists as superintendent. I think they're both people of incredible integrity, so I, I think we're in a, a great position here tonight to have the two finalists that we have. Any other comments on the second motion? Director Meek. I guess I just need to raise the question whether you feel there is a conflict of interest given your pre-existing relationship with Ms. Kane. Are you talking about the $50 she donated to each campaign or which particular thing are you talking about? All of the things I mentioned earlier, um, your pre-existing relationship where you invited her to the private retreat that you held, um, reaching out to her to ask her about the job, the financial contributions, I just, with Colorado law, if you have a conflict of interest, you need to report that. And I just want to raise that as an issue in case it is something that you feel rises to the level for you to report. Do any directors feel that they have a conflict of interest that they need to report? No, I don't. I feel like I didn't know Aaron and I, the weekend of the retreat was a training session and there were numerous people there training us and just that's what it was about and the $50 donation I, I believe that's her right to give to the candidates she wants to and um, so I personally don't have a conflict of interest with Aaron Kane. Any other directors? Okay, if there's no other discussion, oh, go ahead, Director Ray. So, just a, so I would just like to hear, I guess, down the dais, if, if we are at this point of saying, um, you can't go wrong, I think is what I heard you say, Director Peterson, or I heard Director Weiniger say that same, same thing, is you can't go wrong with either of these candidates. Is it worth trying to find a candidate that we can do a 7-0 support or not, or is that, not even something that's a consideration in your decision-making process? I guess that's a question for, for all of us. Um, is there a 7-0 candidate here? And I'd love if there was a 7-0 candidate. I think each director needs to vote uh, appropriately for who they believe the candidate to be. And if there's seven votes for one candidate, I think that's wonderful. But I would not see consensus to change my vote. If I am a sixth one and I am the one, I'm going to continue to vote for the person I believe would be the proper candidate. So for you, just, just reiterating, for you, it's not worth compromising who your number one choice is to get a unanimous support for one of the finalists. For me, it's to put my vote on record for who I believe to be the person to be best suited to be the superintendent for all reasons, and I'd be happy to express those, but sure, correct. I, I guess I would bounce that question back to you um, because you said we couldn't go wrong either. We had two great candidates and both were totally capable. So I guess the question is, if we're all saying that same thing, there's 
there's either going to be a compromise or there's not. And I think that's un just, that's unfortunately where we are. I, 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 again, feel like my responsibility is to, is, is to choose the person that I feel is best in addition to listening to all the comments that have been made both through the forums, emails, public comment, and take that all into consideration. And if, if, I, if I might just, uh, I wanna clarify, I, I didn't make a statement that we can't go wrong. Um, I think we can go wrong um, if we symbolically can't figure out a way to come to some consensus who that person is. And I think that because of that is, um, I, I think our community will not simmer down um, if we choose Aaron Kane over Danny, not because Aaron's not a qualified, wonderful leader, but because symbolically she represents a lot of circumstances that Director Meek has brought up of conflict of interest, of this being premeditated and this being decided back in November. And, you know, you guys have all heard, um, surely, all the, all the banter. And so um, I do want to just clarify, I, I think we can go wrong tonight um, because I think we will just continue, unfortunately, the turmoil and the strife uh, unless we can come to some consensus on one of the, the candidates. So I'm disappointed. I respect the perspective and, and what's motivating you to uh, select the person you're selecting. So th I, I appreciate the honest responses. And, and I would talk to that symbolism a little bit. Um, I don't think we're doing something symbolic. I think we're doing something functional here for the district tonight. This isn't about symbolism. And you talked about it, this being a symbolic moment and this being unfortunate. Um, we had a uh, public comment, or not tonight, but at the previous meeting, that talked about um, where that symbolism comes from. Does it come from the candidate, or does it come from uh, another place to surround that candidate in that symbolism, to surround them in a narrative that, frankly, creates this chaos out of something that is either not accurate because you even said, I don't know if it's true. I don't know if it's not true. I don't know. I don't know. I would not react to that symbolism. I would ask each director to reach down and make an honest assessment of who they believe is the best person for the district and cast a vote accordingly. I am certainly not going to cast a vote based on, on a symbolic gesture or to react to any narratives that I do not believe to be true. So again, that's not a slight on one candidate or the other. That's just a simple weighing of who I believe, and I suggest each director do the same, to be the best person to lead the district. Um, any other director comments? Okay, we have a second motion which we would address first, and that motion was made by Director Ray, seconded by Hansen, to modify the resolution to insert the name of Danny Windsor as the sole finalist. Um, we will come back to the first resolution, um, depending. Uh, so I'd like to call the roll on the second motion, which is uh, an I vote would be to modify, uh, just so we're very clear here, an I vote would be to modify the resolution to insert the name of Danny Windsor as the sole finalist. A no vote would be to not modify it. That is not a vote for Aaron Kane. That is just not to modify the resolution with the name of Danny Windsor. With that, I will call the roll. Director Hansen. Aye. Director Meek? Aye. Director Myers? No. Director Peterson? No. Director Ray? Aye. Director Williams? No. Director Weiniger? No. Defeated by a vote of three uh, ayes to four noes. We'll now take up the an original motion, which was a motion to modify the resolution to insert the name of Eric and Aaron Kane as the sole finalist. Motion made by Myers, seconded by Williams, and we can have discussion on that motion. Any directors wishing to comment or discuss the primary motion? Director Myers, I know you took some time, so. <laughs> yes, I've taken my time. I just really feel Aaron Kane is the most qualified superintendent, and uh, listening to spending all day answering emails today, the numerous people for Aaron Kane, and actually stating that 
she will bring unity. She will. She knows how to build trust with the teachers. She knows how to go without to every school, and she knows how to have that personable with kids, teachers, staff, and even with in this building. So I just believe she's the one that can just get get things done, get our teachers paid, and get our education back on track. So. That's where I'm at. Any other directors? I'll go ahead and make some comments on, on Aaron Kane. The criteria that I looked at or that I'm looking at you know, when I'm looking at a superintendent is the, the biggest thing I think that needs to happen in this district is reestablishing the partnership between parents and teachers in supporting our students. If we get that one thing right and only that one thing, I think this district will achieve its potential. And so starting with that is the what I believe to be the strategic goal for a superintendent. Um, I see someone in Aaron Kane that can not only represent teacher voice and give them a voice in the district and honor that voice, but also be firm in someone who has not only the potential to walk the path, but has actually walked the path of superintendent for two years as an interim and has come out on the other side and, and has the fortitude to um, lead uh, with expectations, but also lead with honor and integrity. Uh, I also see someone who respects the role of the parent in that relationship, that will honor the teachers, that will insist that parents te uh, treat teachers respectfully, but will also understand that the parent has the primary role in the raising of their child, whether it is health decisions, whether it's decisions around curriculum, what to opt into, what to opt out to, uh, what to opt out of, and to always put academic growth and achievement as the North Star of this district. Yes, we need mental health. Yes, we need security. Yes, we need social emotional learning. We need a lot of stuff. But all of those items should be in support of the academic success and achieve the mission and the vision. The mission and the vision is getting kids ready for what's next. We had an awesome example of CTE and CE and where that fits into the role and preparing students. And that should be the singular metric of this district. When children leave this district, are they literate? Are they ready to go directly into the workforce or pursue post-secondary education or pursue a life of service, whether it be in the military in some other place? Are they ready if they are students with special needs, like we heard from so many of the parents of the GEM Center tonight? Are they ready to move to some form of independent living and self-advocacy within their reach? And most importantly, are we looking at our students as individuals are we helping them achieve their own individual unique potential? And I think Erin Kane has proven that she can do that and that she can continue to do that and bring the common healing, specifically bridging the divide that we seem to have in some areas between parents and teachers, but understanding and restoring that parent voice. And then finally, something a little bit more businesslike. We heard from MBEC uh, Chair Brownrig earlier tonight. We should pursue a bond and MLO as they, as they advise us. And I think the entire community needs to support that. This is something that Aaron Kane has achieved previously successfully. But I also trust her to have a plan that should we not pass an MLO this year, should we not pass an MLO the next year, she has the acumen and the financial wherewithal to figure out a way that we can keep this going for our teachers, give them the comp that they need, do the construction to meet the needs, those educational voids that uh, we have been briefed on in our areas and address the education needs for our community. I think she'll put this district back on focus on academics and I trust her to do so. And my final testament is her followership. The followership that she has achieved in the number of people that have followed her when she uh, went to American Academy, when she came here and the people that continue to follow her to the ends of the earth is an absolute testament of leadership um, that I think is unparalleled in this district. And when she comes back, should she be voted in, I think she will gain that trust and followership in the district. Um, with that, I'll conclude my remarks and Director Williams, go ahead. So I'll keep 
mine uh, short and sweet. So I too think it's important to take teachers uh, voice into consideration. And last public comment, we had a lot of employees uh, from American Academy who have worked underneath her and have a testament to who she is as a leader and uh, who, who she is as a teacher, even though she hasn't necessarily been in the classroom. In addition, she has a big love for DCSD because she's, she's, coming, she's trying to come back for a second time to do this all over again in a contentious uh, environment. Um, and then uh, obviously the, the big thing right now is the MLO and the bond potential for this November. She has the experience. She was out talking about this in 2018, even after she left her position as interim superintendent and went back to American Academy. She was out advocating for this and she has an extensive knowledge of how School Finance Act works and her, her financial background uh, with, with managing budgets is, is pretty stellar. And so I, I, I support her because I think she can get the teachers what, what they want. In addition, she can, give, she can bring a good culture for the teachers and, I, and for those reasons, I, I support Erin. Any other directors? Okay, if there's no other comments by directors, we'll take up the original motion, which was to modify the resolution to insert the name of Aaron Kane as the sole finalist. Call the roll, Director Hansen. I, I feel like it is, I, I honestly feel like it is very important to provide the new superintendent a 7-0 vote to, to say that we are going to stand behind them. Um, I would like the opportunity to pass my vote. Um, I have been instructed for the community, I have been instructed by President Peterson that as the first person called alphabetically during the vote, I expect you to either respond I or no, unless you wish not to vote at all or have a conflict of interest. Um, I don't know what's going to happen in the next six votes, and it puts me in a really um, unfortunate position, but um, while I would like to send a message of support to Ms. Kane in the event that there are four votes, I don't know what's going to happen, and I have to vote no. Director Meek. So I guess I just have to say, I wish Ms. Kane would have disclosed that she had prior relationships and had worked with board members previously. Um, and I think there's gonna be trust issues that are gonna plague the board a little bit. Um, I will be open with her, I will be honest with her, I will work with her. Um, she was not my top choice and I am gonna have to vote no based on the way we all spoke about, we're gonna vote for who we think is best, not compromise. And so I'm a no vote, but I will work with her and be as open and honest and do everything possible to help our students be successful. Director Myers. Yes. We did have a moment here in I was hoping we could get to one seven zero vote, but I do acknowledge I was the one that said vote your conscience, so I appreciate the other directors voting their conscience. Um, before I cast my vote, you have to be very careful what you ask for. And the one thing that I believe of Erin Kane is she will be a strong superintendent. And that means that she will push back against all members of the board, myself included. And I know that that's what a vote for Aaron Kane will do, and I am willing to live by that because I believe, like actually Danny Windsor said, the focus for this district should not be on this board. I believe that the proper role of the board, yes, we have ends, we have policy, policy governance, we have oversight of a superintendent, evaluation of a superintendent, accountability of a superintendent is the singular employee, employee. but I leave the, believe this district needs an absolute strong committed leader, and that means 
that superintendent should be out in front leading this district and we should do the best as a group of seven to support that superintendent. And I believe Aaron Kane will be an absolutely strong and courageous leader. And I think sometimes she's gonna push back real hard on me and I'm okay with that. And so with that, I vote aye for Aaron Kane. Director Ray. Yeah, I would, I would just echo too that um, certainly for the sake of the district, Absolutely, we need to support whoever is the superintendent. And, and I think I probably have a longer relationship with Aaron than the rest of you, quite honestly. And so I'm, uh, I have no qualms about picking up right where Aaron and I left off. And, and certainly, we will uh, continue to have some great conversations. Um, however, that said, um, I do not believe this is what's best for our district. And so my vote is a no. Director Williams. Aye. Director Weiniger. Um, I really appreciated this civil discourse we had in agreeing to disagree. It was very refreshing and um, my vote is aye. Director uh, Weiniger is an aye. The motion to amend and insert Aaron Kane's name as sole finalist is passed by a vote of four to three. Moving on. Uh, sorry, thank you. At this point, uh, Mr. Blair, do we have uh, Aaron Kane online? Thank you. Okay, if you could bring her up, I'd like to offer uh, Ms. Kane an opportunity to make a, make a few remarks before we move on to the next item. Aaron Kane, can you hear us? I can. Can you hear me? We can. Go ahead. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Um, first of all, I, I, I know it's really late and I don't want to make a lot of remarks, but I do want to say um, that I'm extremely humbled to have been chosen as the next superintendent um, for this school district, one that I'm committed to and I love. Um, I really want to thank Danny Windsor. Um, it was great to go through this very intensive process with somebody that I respect so much and consider a friend. We supported each other the whole time and I'm very grateful for that. Um, Everything that you all said about Mr. Windsor is 100% correct. I'm very grateful for his leadership in this district, and I look forward to working with him uh, to benefit the kids of our district as we move forward. Um, and I, I know there is so much conflict in our district, and I will commit myself to work with all seven board directors and to make sure that I represent all seven board directors in the work that I do as I follow the board's direction. Um, I've talked to people in the last few weeks on both sides, and I can tell you three things. People are tired of the conflict. Everyone I've spoken to, regardless of where they're coming from, is committed to our kids, our teachers, our staff, and this school district. Um, and finally, I would say the distance between us is not anywhere near as much as you would be led to believe. Um, we all share many concerns around literacy in our special education students and certainly our funding and paying our staff um, more competitively so that we can keep and uh, retain the best teachers and staff. Um, we can't change the conflict that's in our world or in our country, but I think we can work right here in Douglas County if we all work together to listen to each other, understand each other's concerns, um, and I, I would be privileged to lead bridging that divide. I do think we can absolutely bridge the divide and move forward for the thing that we all have in common. Our common cause is and always has been our students, all 64,000 of our students. Um, and moving forward for them is the best thing that we can do. And I think Douglas County School District has a very, very bright future. And I really look forward um, to working with the board to go into that future. So thank you so much again. Thank you, Ms. Kane. At this point, we'll move on to item number 19, retention of legal counsel in the matter of Robert Marshall v. Douglas County Board of Education et al. Uh, the recommendation is that the board approve retention of additional counsel in the matter as presented. With that, we'll take any questions before we have any motions. Director Meek. Thank you. Um, so I have to question how this is before us right now. I have no background knowledge on the need for additional legal counsel, the process that was used to put this one contract before us that we are supposed to be voting on. 
Um, I would have thought that maybe we would have learned a lesson by now that we need to have public conversation before we're gonna rubber stamp something at a board meeting. And so it would be really helpful for me to understand the background and how we're voting on this right now. Okay, any other questions before we have that discussion? Okay, I brought this uh, forward. I did reach out to uh, the law firm the very end of last week. Uh, based, frankly, on the where we are in the case, my personal opinion, only one director, one member of the board, which is being uh, named as a defendant in the case. Um, we have a preliminary injunction, which to me personally seems uh, unclear. There's different interpretations we have gotten from different lawyers. And there is, frankly, I think, a larger case here. Um, we've heard plenty of speakers tonight talk about violations of law. Um, I personally have gone and said that uh, I do not believe that we have violated any Colorado open meeting laws. And that's the larger question here, whether the judge's interpretation, and there are other matters to be decided in this case, um, become a Colorado law. Certainly he referenced um, Hawaii, Ohio, Nevada, and California in citing uh, other states' laws in rendering his preliminary injunction. And my fear is if this case moves forward and we don't have competent legal representation and varied and diverse opinions on what the impact could be, that this could create new Colorado law that would not only affect this district and its board's ability to operate, it will affect other school boards across the state, it will affect councils, it will affect uh, other boards, whether that is uh, special district authorities, whether that is other councils, and could wind up, frankly, having a fundamental change to Colorado law. So I think having a additional counsel uh, to add to the legal team, to have wider perspectives on what the available options are here, not to duplicate efforts, but to separate efforts and have different wider perspectives. We always are here in the uh, district talking about diversity. So diversity of perspective and diversity of thought in a case that may be this consequential, I believe is needed. Where did I come up with this firm to propose uh, when Council Clemish was initially looking at this case? and whether it would be picked up by the pool or not. There was a period of time where we were uncertain, and this is a uh, law firm that I was referred to um, and looked at earlier, and I, I believe, but I can't speak for them, other directors looked at when we did not have a law firm assigned and we may have to sign another. So that's what this um, is doing. My last comments on it is if you look at the letter of retention, just to be clear for those that, are, that have not looked at the attachment, it is only to return or to retain this law firm if accepted by the majority of the board. First of all, to be retained for the entire board in this matter, um, not to be retained for an individual director or a group of individuals. This is for the entire board. And this retention would only be for the Marshless v. Uh, Douglas County Board of Education case. This is not to retain this firm as a board council or just general continuing council. It is for this specific matter and for this board. And then the last thing that I would put out, because I know this constantly gets brought up, it would be at a fee arrangement that is comparable to current attorneys here. So this is not bringing in a, um, a firm that costs three, four times as much and that they would uh, separate the work to make sure we're not being double billed. So again, this would be a firm brought in specifically and only for this case to add different, uh, additional perspectives. Any other director comments? Director Hansen. So just to clarify, we would continue our contract or our work with Hall and Evans and we would just be adding a second law firm. So we'll have two law firms representing us. This would be in addition, at least for this point until some other further decision was made, correct? <laughs> Director Ray, did you, I'm sorry, Director Meek? I'll defer to Director okay, Meek. Okay, Director Meek, then Director Ray. So I, I guess I have a concern where you said, it this would be representing both the board and the four individuals. I don't think that's possible to do without a conflict of interest. I think there are different interests at stake. What may be best for the district may look really different than what is best for the four named board members. And I think 
I think we ran into that. I think we've been challenged with this issue and I would only see it getting exacerbated by adding another contract with the same conflict of interest that's in there. So I don't know if anyone is open to splitting out and having separate legal counsels perhaps, but it just feels like there is a huge conflict of interest thinking that the interests are the same for the board versus for named individuals. Okay, I believe the interest of the board is to defend the case brought by the plaintiffs. Um, we could talk about voting on this in terms of recusals. We've had some thoughts about recusals. Um, I wonder if it's a conflict of an interest for some of the members sitting at the dais here tonight to even vote on this issue, seeing as they were witness for the plaintiff in the preliminary injunction, that they provided uh, evidence in the form of unilaterally recorded conversations for the plaintiff, um, that they were not only just named on the plaintiff's uh, witness for the plaintiff, but actually in one case testified for the plaintiff. So there, I agree, there may be uh, different ideas sitting at this dais as to what the resolution should be. However, counsel of record here is appointed to defend the district against the plaintiff, and I would expect any appointed counsel to do exactly that, to defend the district against what the plaintiff has accused. President Peterson, that's a gross misrepresentation of what happened, and I think you know that. Um, we were subpoenaed to provide documents. Um, I'm not a fan of ignoring court subpoenas, and um, as an attorney calling, uh, the, the plaintiff's attorney can call anyone they want, and um, refusing to show up and testify, again, not a great move. Um, so to say that, and I wasn't called, but I know that Director Meek was called and Director um, Ray was called by the plaintiff's counsel, um, <laughs> they don't have an option whether or not to show up and they don't have an option whether or not to produce documents. So um, if we're going to talk about calming um, or inciting a false narrative, um, those are the kind of comments that need to stop. Okay, but you don't deny the facts that we did have directors testify for the plaintiff and we did have directors provide, although requested by the court, material for the plaintiff. Um, they were subpoenaed and they were called as a witness. Okay, thank you. Any other director comments or questions? Director Ray. I'll start out with a question. You, uh, Director Peterson said that you were referred to this law firm and I don't think you, I know you said you had conversation with Ms. Clemish, but I don't think it was Ms. Clemish that referred you, so I just wanted to clarify who referred you to this law firm? Uh, I received the referral from, um, I think, multiple people. I think they contacted me and said that they were referred, that we may need counsel and that they'd be willing to defend uh, the district. This was not recently. This is preliminarily when uh, we were being sued by, uh, by Robert Marshall. They did reach out and said that they would be willing to defend the district. They being law firms reached out? The, the, or The law firm. Through, but they were referred to someone else. I don't know who the original person that told them we were being sued or how they became aware of it. Yeah. So I guess a couple of thoughts, if I, if I may. Um, one thing I appreciate, Director Peterson, I know that you're always looking at the bigger picture of things and how will Little Douglas County impact other states like Hawaii. And, um, you know, I, I appreciate that perspective. But quite honestly, uh, I think we need to focus on Douglas County uh, and not be concerned about the ripple effect or the impact it might have on other boards. Um, and certainly my understanding is until there's a permanent injunction, we're not even close to uh, other boards having an impact by, by that. Which, which I guess goes with my next thought is it just feels like this is premature um, to me. Um, and, I, and it's unfortunate that we've got this other resolution now after this that I think is probably almost needs to be discussed first um, before we start adding counsel to the case because I, I believe the resolution will give us an opportunity to do a little bit of exploratory kind of work 
about the preliminary injunction. And I think until that, that exploratory work is done or getting clarification uh, is done, that it makes no sense to all of a sudden add uh, or retain another counsel. And I respect what you said earlier that we certainly don't um, pay for that person until we actually access them. But it just seems to me that this is, I don't understand why this uh, needs to be decided or discussed now when we do have a law firm that is serving our best interest. We do have a law firm that, that's hearing us in terms of our counsel for next steps um, in terms of how we want to move forward. So to me, it just seems like this is kind of came out of the, for me, out of the, out, out of the uh, clear blue and doesn't really make sense to me at this stage of the game. Okay, other directors? Director Meek. Yeah, I guess I feel it's important for me to raise this because our actions have consequences. I talk about this all the time. So during your campaign for school board, you stated you would bring the community together. You said you would be transparent, you would be accountable. You assured voters you were not connected to the reform board. I am telling you, hiring this firm, people are going to again equate this. I, I don't know if you're aware, but Scott Gessler, you know, put his own gubernatorial campaign on hold to come out in 2013 to campaign for the reform board. Like he was very connected and people are gonna use that as a reason not to trust the board and to say, yes, you're still connected, it's the reform board. I know we're talking about trying to pass an MLO and bond and every action we take has consequences. And we're either building trust or we're destroying trust. And we receive emails saying stop spending taxpayer dollars and just start following the law. Verbatim, I ask all seven of the directors, stop wasting taxpayer money, stop eroding goodwill in the community. You know, people are asking us just to stop. If, we, if you want clarity on the law, there's a free option. You can connect with your legislators and have them work on writing new law. And if it can be passed, it will provide additional details. If you feel like it's appropriate for daisy chain conversations to happen outside of public meetings, work with your legislators and try to get that passed. Those are steps you can take to work on clarifying the open meeting law, try to make changes that you want to make, but do it on your dime, not on the taxpayer dime. And I think that's a really important thing for us to consider right now because we heard public comments saying people are not going to want to give us or trust us with a local measure if we're spending money frivolously and spending money on this appeal or moving forward with this is frivolous. I think we have other options before us. Thank you for your comments, Director Meek. I would say that uh, mentioning a narrative that could affect this is in some cases a creation of that narrative or reinforcing a narrative. I'm not upset or concerned with a narrative. What I'm concerned with is competent, diverse, law firm getting this case right and just honoring and understanding what is Colorado law, what is not Colorado law, and what the proper actions are here. And I believe that to be absolutely in the best interest of this district and this board moving forward. And uh, in fact, bringing again, we say we embrace diversity, having a diversity of opinion here with multiple law firms looking at it, looking at what they believe the course of action being and going forward. I think is in the best interest here and may even lead to a speedier resolution of this, which would ultimately save taxpayer money. Any other directors? Director Ray. So are you suggesting that you don't feel Holland Evans is capable to carry the um, pursuit of this legal challenge? I don't understand. This, if I believe that, you would be seeing, in my opinion, you would see something to say to uh, move on from Holland Evans. This is not 
this says nothing about Hall and Evans. This That's says bring an additional counsel on for an extra perspective. You use the terms competent, and I just, I guess I was hearing you assume that this was, that this law firm offered a different level of competency than, than Hall and Evans. So thanks for that clarification. But I, I, I would agree with Director Meek, the optics are horrible. Um, when we are trying to prepare to ask the community for additional resources, and we're stacking up with lots of legal uh, counsels to advise us. It, it makes it really, the optics are really poor. Um, and, and, and I still don't understand why Gessler was chosen either, because Director Meek's right. This, the, he, this individual's a lightning rod for a lot of controversy, whether it's, you know, he's, he's supporting the, 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 the current uh, county clerk down in Mesa who was just arrested for uh, election fraud, and, and, you know, he's running for a state position for the GOP. I mean, I'm just... I'm very concerned that you're, again, like Director Meek said, you're just opening this up again for a lot of criticism, a lot of frenzy that's going to say, yeah, they're, they're not only they're misusing funds, but they are politicizing once again by selecting someone that is really a political lightning rod in our state right now, I believe. Um, so I, so I, I'm against two things. I'm against this firm in particular because I don't think we need to bring additional controversy to our district, but I'm also against even considering retaining an additional law firm, which has not been our previous practice. We typically have one law firm uh, focus on an issue, and uh, I think we have heard from other attorneys. It's pretty complicated to do co-legal uh, representation. It takes a lot of more coordination to figure out who's doing what. And, and I, so I think we just are adding complexities to things that, to me, um, don't need to, to be that complicated. Um, and I was really, like I said, looking forward to our resolution that we would just have some time to really do some exploratory to understand what is the impact of this injunction so that we don't go down a road of investing, desperately need resources. I mean, we heard our public commenters talk about, you know, I can't even get textbooks in my classroom yet. You guys are talking about adding another uh, law firm to this, this legal claim. And so uh, I just think the optics are horrible. And I would just um, tell you that I, I have no understanding of why we would even consider this at this time. So. Thank you, Director Ray. Any other directors? Awesome. Director Williams. So when it comes to the money aspect, I guess I see two different things. The first thing I see is that we just by agreeing to the resolution doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to, to utilize, especially if we do pass the next resolution with some amendments that um, could potentially happen. Um, so, so that's the first thing. And the second thing is, it's not like we will be double paying. The, the, the money is close, it's very close to the same. And so I don't really see a, a conflict there either. So, and, and I do believe that it's okay to have some di diversity when you're looking at different things. And I will also say to your question earlier, just for transparency, um, when, when the case was originally brought forth, I had a lot of people reaching out. I mean, I'm, I'm sure you can imagine. And um, this is one of the firms that actually reached out to me personally as well. And so I'm just gonna throw that out there so that's not a surprise if it ever comes up later. Um, but that, and, and so before we were assigned uh, the, the law firm, I did a lot of research just from people's referrals. And so that's how they came to, to to mind for me as well. And I think uh, Director Weiniger has her hand up. Okay, Director Weiniger, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to share my viewpoint on all this. Um, the person who we should be looking at that's wasting district money is the plaintiff. They're the ones who brought this case against us and our insurance did cover it at first. And then they decided to change their lawsuit and then our insurance dropped us after we were already assigned Hall and Evans. So we kept with them because we were like, that's fine. I mean, we know we did nothing wrong. Um, unfortunately, we disagree with how the judge interpret the law. And so we have every right 
when I say we, I mean the district, I mean the school board. Um, we have every right to um, appeal that. So I see nothing wrong with um, doing so. And I think it is the best interest of the school board to do so. And I personally did not appreciate the plaintiff's lawyer coming at us and saying we should just cut our losses and not appeal and pay his high lawyer fee because we lost. And um, yeah, that's that's my take. And I have no issue with trying bringing in another firm because like Christy said, it's not like <clears throat> we're, we'll be w, double paying. It's more like we're, um, my understanding was we're, we are transferring to them, but um, I could be wrong. I, I, I don't want us to be double paying. I don't think that's right, but I think we felt like, or I felt like anyway, that Hall and Evans didn't do the best representation of us because obviously the judge didn't um, agree with them. And so let's try someone else. Let's try someone else for this appeal. And um, I see no harm in that. And I think that honestly is what's best for our district. And then we won't owe any fees once we win the appeal. Thank you, Director Weiniger. Director Myers. I think that we all uh, received the same email regarding someone that did encourage us to appeal this because of this court's decision that this might alter the way that the Open Meeting Act has been interpreted for the last 50 years. And I think that if we have what's happened in this district, then it might set a precedent for Douglas County, for all councils, for all school boards, for all charters. And as for politicization, Director Ray, bringing up a lawyer uh, representing Tina Peters and alleging she's already guilty before she's, just because she's been accused by the Secretary of State of Colorado that she's uh, did something wrong, I think that has yet to be proven that she really did do something wrong. She was doing her job. Back to Douglas County. Um, I just want to remind everyone that the, the, the injunction that was entered is not going to impact anyone outside of Douglas County. If you think back to the analogy I used when we were in executive session, we're running a marathon and the, the injunction is just in the first couple of miles. We have an entire race to go. And until we have a final decision from the court, there is no impact, there is no change, it's not changing anything else. Um, it, it has zero impact on anyone but the seven of us until this case is ultimately decided. So um, I, while I appreciate that we're, we're trying to take care of everybody else, there's really no reason to consider the ultimate direction that open meeting law um, interpretation goes until there's a final adjudication on this. Which is why I believe it's even better to have a diversity of opinion on the, uh, the team. And if we were to approve this resolution to have um, that diversity of perspective ensure that we don't lose this case to give us the best defense possible uh, so that when it is concluded, it is included, uh, concluded in favor for the district. Director Wright, go ahead. And I just want to clarify, we're, we're not discussing whether we're appealing this or not. So I, I want us to be careful too that we're not off topic um, because that's a whole nother part of the marathon um, that we have to consider when we get to that point. So, um, so again, just wanted to keep us focused on uh, the question is whether we add this legal counsel uh, to our repertoire now um, and again, I would advocate that it's premature until we really know what we're dealing with. Um, we shouldn't be adding additional attorneys. And, and, and one question I do have, uh, Director Peterson and, and Director Williams, you kind of addressed this too. There were some previous conversations with this law firm. Are they already doing work? Because there's some reports that they're already gathering calendars for the past two years from board. And so, so I just wanted like to understand to answer, that. Like, I haven't even spoken to them, to be quite honest. I, I was left a message. Okay. And so that's how I was reached out to by this law firm. I never returned the phone call. And there has not been more uh, talking back and forth. So I have not spoken to anybody at this firm. So I want to throw that out Thanks. first. Thanks. And um, like I said, I just researched on my own. But I did not talk to anybody from the firm. So they're not doing, they're not already collecting the, artifacts or the, the only district. work that uh, related to the board was when I contact, and this is all by the way, in, in email, 
Um, I did reach out to them on Friday and ask for this letter of retention. And then there were a couple emails back and forth um, with including counsel that, that were to just look at the quality of this letter and was it accurate and appropriate and formatted and, and was it clear? That's the only work that they've done. And I do not believe there's been one bit of billing because they're not retained yet. So <laughs> the only thing that they've done that I've asked them to do is simply supply this letter uh, of engagement. I'm oh, sorry, go ahead. No. Uh, okay. So. I did That's, a, just want to follow up question ahead. then. I know Director Williams did you did a lot of research of this firm. So I'd be curious to know what that research caused why, why that research caused you to feel confidence in this firm. But then I also would like to know, did we research any other firms or did we just go to this one and just say, for some reason this is the person we want to hire? So I, I probably should have brought my notes. <laughs> um, so I don't have them in front of me. But I, um, I researched a, a few different firms just from people reaching out to me and saying, potentially, you should look at, at this. And um, so for, for tra I'm happy to pass those along to everybody if everyone wants to see them. But I, um, I don't have them with me right now. I did also look at other firms when we were unclear whether there would be an assignment from the pool or not uh, previously. So I did uh, did my own research, asked other folks who would they recommend, uh, did Google research, et cetera. I did not reach out to anyone, nor research. <laughs> <laughs> so I'd like to, oh, we don't even have a motion, so we've just done discussion. So is there a motion regarding the retention of legal of additional legal counsel in the matter of Robert Marshall versus Douglas County uh, as presented uh, in the form of an engagement letter? I, I would motion to do that, but also with the stipulation that says that it's not ne necessarily meaning that we're going to use them, but it's a potential for us to use them, correct? Yeah, there would. this is just to sign the, the, the motion here would be to sign and accept the letter. And just to be clear for those that aren't following along, this would be myself, the president, signing on behalf of the board if the majority of the board chose to retain the organization. And I believe it would be uh, the council, the district council, signing on behalf of the council uh, to confirm that they were being retained only in this matter. Uh, this does not say uh, the amount of use, the lack of use, the continued use. All this says is that they are retained and would be an additional council of record. Uh, I assume that if they are retained on any motion that we would vote on for council of record, that the councils would coordinate to make, figure out which council was handling that particular issue with the concept of we wouldn't have multiple councils handling the same issue to avoid double billing. Director, uh, I'm sorry, Director Meek, then Director Ray. Yeah, I guess I just wonder how will they be directed? Who is directing them to do what work? Because I feel like the full board hasn't really had the same direction with Hall and Evans, not Hall and Oates. And um, <laughs> I would just like to have clarity on what that process looks like. Yeah, and I think that goes, without getting into the discussion on it, that would go to the following resolution and anything we would do in future meetings. Um, so without going into the specifics, we have a resolution uh, on the next item to have the board as a group of seven provide potentially some recommendation to council on record. I think if the councils came back to us and said we have uh, options here or we have gates that need to be met time-wise or we have option A, B, or C, they would uh, indicate that to the board members. We would probably convene an executive session as appropriate to discuss legal advice if we had, especially if we had different councils that gave us different options. And then we would come out like we may do here in a little bit on the next item. And we would provide that direction as a board uh, of seven. Director Ray. One thing that I would just recommend that we add to this retention letter, and I don't know if that's doable bef uh, now or not, but certainly what's been problematic for us is the communication piece in terms of when a director consults with the, an attorney needing, all of us needing to be 
informed at the same level. And I don't see anything in here where it talks about that, where uh, this retention letter speaks to if one director speaks, then that information will be made available or that this attorney will write a memo to us informing us that I had a conversation with Director Ray, here's what we spoke about, this is how long we talked. Um, I just feel like that, that, that needs to be stipulated because that's been problematic for us um, in the past. Yeah, I, I'm just looking at number two here, which which says that who they will represent, uh, or I'm sorry, um, party representatives number one, uh, says the Douglas County School Board and the name people. So everyone that's listed as a defendant to include the board as a whole. And then I'm also looking under number three. Um, it says, after we complete work, we will uh, not assume continuing responsibility to advise you on matters affecting work. Um, you know, unless we both agree in, you know, for future stuff. So this is limited to this case. But again, as the represented party, I would uh, hope that our represented uh, council of record will inform the entire board as to what they're doing in their actions as council of record. I know that we have asked uh, Hall and Evans to increase their communications to all boards beyond billing and other things that they're documenting to make sure that as council of record, they continue to uh, better inform the board as to all decisions and what's going on. That's what I'm just thinking. Yeah. If we can do something on the front end that can um, deter us from having to come back and say, please over communicate like we've done with a couple of our attorneys, I just think it'd be uh, prudent for us to get that language in there on the front end. Yeah, and I certainly think if we have any specific direction to council, we can certainly include that in any direction to council to say, you know, obviously communicate with us on this matter. Director Meek, go ahead. Yeah, I don't think hope is a strategy. I think we need to be very explicit that we are all kept informed within 24 hours of communications that happen. I, I don't, I think I need to see that in a contract. Go ahead, Director Williams. Right, so number 14 says any modification just to this agreement must be in writing and signed by both you and the firm. So I guess my question to everybody on the board is if uh, we would like to add that modification, uh, would, can, can we vote saying that we would accept this if that modification was um, put in place and that President Peterson would then have the ability to sign this um, after that modification was made, when and if? I believe the way I'm reading this is we would have to accept the letter as is and then we could make a modification and we could certainly um, vote that at a future meeting. I certainly think you could make a conditional motion, Director Williams, if you wanted to make a conditional motion of accepting this agreement with the condition that something be added to it um, in writing per the agreement on, as stated in number 14. Um, I, don't, I don't think that would be problematic, Director Peterson. So um, I, I will just say I'm not <laughs> in support of this just because of the, again, what we've just discussed earlier, um, the, the need and the optics are bad. So I'll back out of it and let you move forward. Okay, any further discussion? Okay, do I have a motion regarding the letter of retention? So moved. Uh, is your motion to approve the letter of retention as presented? Yes. Okay, motion by Myers as presented. Second. Second by Williams. I will take the vote. Uh, Director Hansen. Uh, well, we're on our third attorney now. At some point, we have to acknowledge that it might not be the attorney's work, but the fact that he is, or he or she, he or she, excuse me, has to work with. Um, we do not have the community trust to pass an MLO right now, period. And dumping money into a second law firm, um, a more expensive law firm for that fact, um, just takes additional funds away from kids, academics, teachers, all of the things that we are saying we value and turning around and immediately um, acting differently. I am an adamant no. Director Meek. No. Director Myers. Yes. 
Director Peterson, aye. Director Ray. No. Director Williams. Aye. Director Weiniger. Aye. Passed four to three. You'll now take up item number 20, which is a resolution regarding uh, the matter of Robert Marshall versus Douglas County Board of Education. The res resolution uh, provides two whereas statements saying <clears throat> that litigation has been filed and that a court order has been entered. And the two resolutions, uh, part of this would be to direct the Council of Record in the litigation to request and pursue an enlargement of time, also known as an extension, to file a motion for reconsideration of the order and an alternative, a clarification. Uh, while appointment of additional counsel is considered, and then be it further resolved that the council, if the ex extension is granted, to file a motion for reconsideration of the order and in the alternative, uh, clarification of the order. So basically it's saying file an extension, and if they, the extension is granted with the judge, look for reconsideration uh, or clarification so that the judge can better um, communicate what is meant by his order. And with that, we will have discussion before we have any motions. Director Ray. Um, could we discuss, uh, and I'm trying to be careful not to compromise executive session, but there's also another pathway to this resolution that is possible and that is the exploratory, and I'm lacking the words because it's after midnight, but it's a consent something or other decree, consent are, decree. Are, are you suggesting that we amend to also include the direction to council to evaluate the appropriateness of a consent decree in the matter? Yes, and, and, I, and I think it'd be helpful, and I don't know if Ms. Clemish would be able just to give us a definition of consent decree, or is that, um, just to get, kind of have, so our public understands how that's a... I'm not in a position and I will not provide legal advice as to what a consent decree might be in this litigation. I'm not counsel of record right. and I am not going to speculate about what a consent decree might be in this particular situation or to provide legal advice in, the, in that regard. And I apologize. I didn't mean for it to be for specific for this or if, if there's just the term, the legal term consent decree, if, could we get just a, a working definition of what that means? Not, not for this litigation, but that's a legal term that an attorney uses, right? That's... Is I that? don't represent the board either, but okay. I can just give a general, I feel comfortable just giving a general explanation um, of, what, of what we would be talking about. A consent decree would just be us working with the plaintiff's counsel um, basically to try and come to an agreement to terms of um, these are the parameters that we both agree on, meets everyone's needs. Um, it's essentially a settlement of sorts um, that we would agree to and all parties would sign off on to the, the language included in that. Thank you. So, so I will say with those questions answered, I, that is my recommendation, Director Peterson, that we amend this resolution to include a therefore statement around exploring the opportunity of a consent decree um, as part of our process and I think you've got better words than so, I do. So friendly amendment if I may, um, a motion by Director Ray to amend the resolution as it reads to just add to the last resolution, uh, be it further resolved and just to add the statement at the end that said, and to evaluate the appropriateness of a consent decree in this matter. That is not directing them to pursue it, it's just directing the Council of Record to consider that and possibly discuss it with the, the other parties. Yeah, and, and it, I don't think it's a formal amendment. I think we're wordsmithing right now because Correct. there's not a motion on the table. So right. um, I guess it would just be getting consensus whether or not the board's okay with- Would consider that. Consider yes. that, yeah. Okay, any other discussion around the uh, resolution before we entertain formal motions? Okay. Seeing none, do we have any motions regarding the resolution? Okay. 
given that there's no motion, um, I think that it's appropriate to move on. It's, it's closed. Uh, I'll offer the motion myself, which would be to adopt the resolution with the modification to amend the bottom, the last resolution to just add the language and to evaluate the appropriateness of a consent decree in this matter. So my motion would be to amend the resolution with that one statement and then to approve the resolution as amended. Second. Motion and a second by Myers. I'll call the roll, Director Hansen, to approve the resolution as amended. Again, if I had the option to, to see how votes come in, um, I cannot vote for this. I do not think that we need to spend taxpayer money to clarify anything in this judge's order. Um, I would vote to um, move forward on the, the second portion that we just added with the consent decree, but um, as the motion stands, I have to say no. Okay, no, Director Meek. So we've been entrusted to lead this public organization and spend public dollars on behalf of the school district. And I think we must always act in the best interests of those who have elected us and in the best interests of the organization. Wasting Douglas County taxpayer money on an appeal or this litigation um, to try to prove that it's okay to have daisy chain conversations with three or more board members to discuss and make public policy decisions outside of public meetings is simply ludicrous. And I think it's a violation of our fiduciary duty. No. Director Meek is a no. Director Myers. Yes. Aye. Peterson, aye. Director Ray. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm similar to Director Hansen. I, I do think, because I understand from some of you that there's still not clarity about what the ruling is. I feel like it's clear. Um, I, I feel like my motion a couple of weeks ago that we just need to move forward and, and uh, comply with open meetings law still makes far more sense than dragging this out. Um, I'm uncomfortable with the other language in the resolution, quite honestly, for the reasons that Director Meek um, described and that it just, again, taking additional resources and I think there's a simpler way for us to move forward and, and that's not to drag this thing out and use additional resources. Uh, I think we can get the clarification that the three or four of you need um, without having to go to this extent. So my, my vote is a no. Director Williams. I actually think because we're adding that last sentence that we are um, opening this up to be much shorter and not drug out. So uh, for those reasons, I'm a yes. Director Weiniger. Um, I'm just going to reiterate that it's the plaintiff that's wasting our resources, and I'm a yes. Okay, Director Weiniger is an aye. Motion is passed as amended by a vote of four to three. We move on to uh, Board of Education reports, noting that we did add an item in the amended agenda to uh, potentially move into executive session and adjourn, but we'll do that just prior to adjourn adjournment. So we are on item number 21, Board of Education reports, uh, President report, a Board of Education special meeting regarding superintendent contract. Uh, approval of superintendent contract is uh, planned for 29 March. Agenda planning for the 12 April regularly scheduled <laughs> school board uh, meeting is scheduled for 11.30 on Thursday, 24 March. And uh, I did have a note to give prayers and best wishes to Director Weiniger on her future birth, but I will redraw those comments <laughs> at these times, seeing as she preempted us. Uh, item number 22, Vice President items. So I'm, ex I I'm just going to say I'm excited to go to SAG on Monday. I haven't attended, so I'm, I'm excited to, to attend that. And then also, um, congratulations, Kaylee. <laughs> Item number 23, director items, board committee, and liaison reports from any directors. We'll just start with Director Meek and go down. Yeah, I'll, I'll add my congratulations, uh, Director Weiniger. Very happy for you. Um, the only thing I really want to bring up is 
getting a retreat scheduled as soon as possible now that we have a superintendent that is going to be approved in the near future. I think we need to get that on the books yesterday. And I just want to throw out having conversations around what kind of board do we want to be? What are our values? How do those reflect our community's values? How are we using those values in our decision making? Um, roles and responsibilities with the superintendent and the board, board, or I'm sorry, superintendent evaluation needs to be a big part of that conversation so we can set the person up to be successful because all of us have to agree on what that evaluation looks like. Um, and then lastly, what is our plan to connect with our community? I passed out a draft plan for us to talk about how we can work with our community and rebuild trust. And I'd love to have us connect on that at a retreat. I think that's an excellent suggestion. And uh, I think as soon as we approve the superintendent contract, we can definitely get that back on the schedule for some time that'll work. I actually think we can do that before. <laughs> I mean, because We've already voted, so it's not like we can't talk and figure out schedules. So yeah, I, we can certainly think, start polling availability, right, for as soon as all directors and the superintendent would be available. Uh, moving down, uh, Director Myers. So Monday morning, I had a meeting with the Douglas County Youth Initiative. Great meeting there. Just about we settled on 10 finalists that will receive uh, monetary uh, kids that have been through some rough things. And so this was quite enlightening. Uh, and there was talk of getting out, even with the Douglas County Youth Initiative, and going in and visiting schools other than what we've already been doing, and maybe some connection between that and SAG. So that, I thought that was some good ideas that were floating around. And that's it. Director Ray. Um, how many, I know Director Williams said she's coming to SAG. Anybody else coming to SAG besides Director Williams? All right, cool. Um, I will be sending you, we have a student on SAG that is proposing a student complaint system is one of their projects they were working on. So part of the hitch of bringing you to feed you is to meet with him because he would like an audience with as many board directors as possible. So I'll be sending you, he's got four docs. One is student to system complaints, student to student conflicts, student to staff conflicts, and student appeals and complaint process. And so if you will give that a look, before you attend that meeting, uh, that'll be helpful to him, and and uh, I know he'll he'll appreciate that. So I appreciate all of you coming as well. Looking forward to it to the event. That's all I have. Director Hanson. Director Weiniger, do you have anything for the uh, director reports? Um, no, I don't have anything. I I guess there is an inbox meeting tomorrow that I won't be able to make. It's in person. Um, not sure if anyone's able to cover for me but um yeah um change of plans on things but i'm looking forward to retreat i love that idea and um yeah we'll reconnect when i'm when i'm discharged from this prison i mean this hospital <laughs> okay and with that with that i will move to um uh, the last item, which would be to go into executive session, as stated earlier, we will still have to take a vote to enter executive session. But as a reminder, it would be to receive legal advice on specific legal questions pursuant to CRS 24-6-4024-B concerning the interpretation of superintendent contract provisions and the board's authority regarding the negotiation and approval of superintendent contract. And the request would be to enter executive session and adjourn from executive session uh, so we would basically, if voting to go into, we'd be adjourning at this, uh, we'd be adjourning from executive session, not coming back out to the dais, and requested would be all seven directors, including Director Weiniger virtually, and Melissa Barber from Kaplan and Ernest. Do I have a motion to enter executive session as stated? I move, we move into executive session. Motion by Myers. Second. Second by Williams. I'll call the roll. Director Hansen. Aye. Meek. Aye. Myers. Aye. Peterson. Aye. Ray. Aye. Williams. Aye. Weininger. Aye. 
Okay, at this point, the board will move into executive session and we will adjourn from executive session. This will end the public recording. And we will, uh, Miss Barber, if you're listening, uh, please join the Google Meet from earlier. Uh, if you're not listening, you'll be getting a text from me momentarily to join the meeting. Thank you. <laughs>